All right. Okay, so it's um All it's right. live. I think we should uh, just give it a couple of minutes. Spencer, do you want to give me a heads up when when you think that the okay, so it's um it's All right. live. I think um I think we should uh, just give it a couple of minutes. Spencer, do you want to give me a heads up when, when you think that, okay, nobody can actually, Adam, I think you need to turn off the YouTube if you have that on. I don't have it on. No. Okay. Um, Adam, you can hear all that um, rustling. So if you could just turn off your microphone when you're moving around. So we'll just wait a few more minutes as people come in, maybe starting at around uh, 10.05. I'll start with my introductory remarks. Okay. What, one question. While when the presentations are ongoing, we should turn off our cameras, correct? Or it doesn't matter because it's a webinar mode. Um, the, it won't matter because the, the presenter will be sharing the screen. Um, here's Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Hey. Good morning. <laughs> Put pants on and everything. Fantastic. God. <laughs> um, so it looks like the the attendees saw Sal is saying hello, Adam. Um, so attendees can chat. And it looks like we can message individual presenters, panelists, and we can also men, uh, message panelists plus attendees if we want.
All right. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to Blow Up Architecture in Print. The symposium was conceived to bring together practitioners active in producing and disseminating media about architecture to discuss means, methods, and issues relevant to interpreting and representing built form. Each of today's presenters are individuals with multidisciplinary practices. You will hear from architects who teach, write, make books as well as buildings, and produce work that speculates on the human condition using the representational tools of architecture. We will also hear from a graphic designer with a history as an educator and a practice that transcends scales from print media to installation, and from a writer and editor turned publisher. The common ground that brings this group together is the plane of the page and the volume of the book. Their methods, while diverse in approach, inevitably are underpinned by ideals located in innovative ways of seeing, understanding, perceiving, and communicating. It's a pleasure to welcome Glenn Cummings, Mustafa Faruqi, Rado Geyser, James Graham, Diana Murphy, and Jesus Basalo, who will each be introduced in more detail before their respective presentation. The day will be structured across three 75-minute sessions that each will include successive presentations by two participants, followed by a joint question answer session, during which we will welcome the audience to submit queries via the Q&A. For those of you who are new to the Zoom webinar interface, please note that, button, that this button is different than the chat. Um, I, it should appear uh, at, below in your uh, toolbar, Q&A. So in the first session, Diana Murphy and Rado Geyser will present under the heading Making Books and Translating Content. The second session, Time, Scale, and Material and Design, will feature James Graham and Glenn Cummings. And we will conclude the afternoon with narratives on speculation and realism, presented by Jesus Vasallo and Mustafa Faruqi. Before we begin, some thank yous are in order. First, to my collaborator in realizing this event, Adam Elstein, who has been a productive instigator in the development of the content for Blow Up. Dean Harriet Harris and the Pratt Faculty Development Fund need to be acknowledged for their generous support of the event. And many thanks are extended to the amazing Seth Thompson who designed and produced our media. And some final thank yous to Meredith Tenor, Federica Venucci, Forzam Yardansky, Valeria Saladillas um, for their event coordination assistance, to Peter Easton and Donna McDougall for their IT expertise, and to my student assistant, Spencer Tokash, for helping moderate the webinar today. So with that, I will um, introduce Adam Elstein, uh, who will launch the first session and tell us a little bit about our first speaker, Diana Murphy. Adam? Am I unmuted now? Awesome. Um, it's wonderful to be here this morning. Um, uh, uh, also, I wanted to thank you, Ashley. It's been a, a extraordinary to collaborate with you in the production of this, of this conference, the symposium. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Diana Murphy. Uh, Diana has had a long and distinguished career uh, as a publisher of architecture, art, and design books. She's currently publisher at the Guggenheim Museum where she oversees all of the museum's publishing activities. Prior to this, she was publisher at Metropolis Books, where she established the imprint as an innovative and highly respected leader in its field, developing many award-winning titles of architecture, design, urbanism, and land use. Um, very much a kind of, um, for me, uh, uh, an inspiration, honestly, for, for a long time. Um, to list all the books Diana has been instrumental in creating would cut seriously into the time she has to speak. So I only note in passing the work she has done with Architectural League of New York, Architecture for Humanity, Deborah Burke, uh, the Cape Cod Modern House Trust, the Center for Land Use Interpretation, uh, Pentagram, Moshe Safdi, Denise Scott Brown, amongst many, many others. Diana Murphy is in short, a bookmaker par excellence, and we are very lucky to have her, very honored to have her as the first speaker in the symposium. So without further ado, I will pass the virtual stage to her. Thank you, Adam. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, hold on one second. <laughs> Sorry.
Are you seeing the right thing, Ashley and Adam, or do I need to switch to, I think I need to switch to slide view, right? You need to go to slide view. Yeah, yeah. slide show. Okay, sorry. Okay, cool. Here we go. Hello. Thank you, Adam. Um, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I know it's super early for some of you, so we especially appreciate you rolling out of bed, or maybe you're still in bed. Um, so I'm the publisher at the Guggenheim Museum. We publish catalogs for our exhibitions and books on aspects of our collection. We also make books on special topics like the one you see here. It's the fruit of a 10 year research project funded by the Mellon Foundation on our Ponza collection, one of the most important holdings of minimal, post-minimal and conceptual art in the world. The project involved curators, conservators, legal experts, the artists themselves, and many, many others. The book has just come off press. It was designed by the wonderful Neil Donnelly and it will be available very soon. So before coming to the Guggenheim, I published and edited a lot of books on architecture, design, urbanism, and art. I'm going to show you some of the books I've published and along the way, I'll weave in some other information about my career. But I wanted to start off with this quote. It's from a piece that Archive Books wrote for a collection of texts called Publishing Manifestos, which the MIT Press released a couple of years ago. A book can problematize the myth of linearity, bear witness to the presence of the past within the present, and highlight the juxtaposition of temporalities and of their resistance to categorization. I think this beautifully evokes the complexity of the experience of reading a book, the sort of psychic flow that goes on inside of you when you read. The idea of nonlinearity is also really relevant to the career path that's pretty common in publishing and the question of who writes architecture books. As a publisher, you constantly have your eye on a ton of various issues like budgets and thinking about a particular graphic designer or writer you really wanna work with not to mention the specifics of each project that's actively underway. On the most macro level, you're also thinking about how your books fit together into a coherent whole and how they engage in the larger conversation, both present and past. Here are a few of the people who for me have been key contributors to this larger conversation over the decades. Part of what interests me about them is the arc of their careers because each one is different. Esther McCoy started out working in New York City as a bookstore clerk, a copy editor, a research assistant, and a writer of fiction and nonfiction. In 1932, suffering from double pneumonia, she relocated temporarily to Southern California to recuperate. She landed in a little bungalow in Santa Monica and ended up living there for the rest of her life. She died in 1989. Esther pieced together freelance work, but in 1942, with the U.S. now engaged in World War II, she was hired as an engineering draftsman at Douglas Aircraft. In 1944, Rudolf Schindler hired her to work as an architectural draftsman in his studio. Up till this point, Esther's nonfiction writing had centered on progressive social and political issues. But in 1945, her career as an architectural writer was launched when she received an invitation from a left-leaning East Coast Journal called Directions to write an article about Southern California. Her subject and the title of her piece, Schindler, Space Architect. Esther was the first person to start writing seriously about the new architecture she was seeing around her in California, particularly in Southern California, and she never stopped writing. She wrote architecture books, two of which you see here, exhibition catalogs, and articles for every American architecture magazine that mattered throughout the 20th century. Esther also became a preservationist, fighting hard for years to save Irving Gill's Dodge House of 1916, which was built on the same street where four years later, Schindler would build his own house and studio. Sadly, the effort to save the Dodge House failed. Eventually, and thankfully for us, Esther, the researcher and writer, became the subject of research and writing, in particular by the architectural historian, Susan Morgan. Susan edited the collection of Esther's writings that you see on the far right. And with Kimberly Meyer, she organized an exhibition at the Mock Center Schindler House and wrote the accompanying catalog, which is on the far left. The newsprint piece in the middle was tucked into the catalog. It tracks the demise of the Dodge House. Mike Davis was a truck driver, a meat cutter, a political activist, and an editor at the New Left Review before he fixed his laser focus on urban history, chronicling the political, economic, 
social and environmental injustices that riddle American cities. We lost Michael Sorkin just over a year ago to the coronavirus. We will continue to miss him for a very long time to come. Michael was an activist, a theorist, futurist, realist, critic, writer, educator, designer, researcher. Most of his design work was unbuilt. Possessed of an unwavering political conscience, he was deeply committed to socially equitable urbanism. Michael was a gifted writer and he published profusely. I urge you to read every book he ever wrote and what you see here isn't even all of them. When we think of Denise Scott Brown, we think planner, architect, writer, educator, and one for whom photography has been a joy and an essential tool. All of these facets that would define her professional identity were already squarely in place by early in her career in the mid 1960s, including the fact that she'd already been to Las Vegas four times before Robert Venturi came out to see what she was so excited about. Both of Denise's marriages were also collaborations rooted in deep creative and intellectual bonds between two individuals. With Venturi, her second husband, this took the form of a professional practice. Collaboration is messaged in the joint authorship of their most important books, such as the ones you see here, Learning from Las Vegas, Architecture as Signs and Systems, A View from the Campidolio. Having Words was published in 2009 under Denise's name alone. It contains pieces that she wrote over the course of 40 years. Some had previously been published, but others were published here for the first time. In 2013, a tsunami of support formed when Denise suggested that the Pritzker Architecture Committee hold an inclusion ceremony to correct the wrong of having awarded 20 years earlier a Pritzker Prize to Venturi, ignoring the fully collaborative nature of his and Denise's practice. A petition was launched by two Harvard students and nearly 10,000 signatures quickly accumulated. Still, the Pritzker Committee declined to act. Since then, more books and exhibitions about the Las Vegas project and about Denise's career as a whole have appeared, but there are more unpublished pieces to be published and more information about a lifetime of work to be shared. Stay tuned. So this is actually the second time I've worked at the Guggenheim Museum. The first time was soon after I finished college. I was hired as the editorial assistant at the museum and it was insanely exciting. Um, and it was the beginning of my life in publishing. I stayed for six years, advancing to the position of editor. I then went to work at Harry Abrams, which was one of the two big prestigious art book publishers in the US. Pretty quickly, I was able to carve out a specialty in architecture and design, focusing whenever possible on women practitioners. And here are three of those books. Women in the Making of the Modern House by Alice Friedman, about women as patrons of modern architecture like the Hollyhock, Hollyhock House and the Farnsworth House. Charlotte Perriand, edited by Mary McLeod and produced in partnership with the Architectural League of New York. At the time, it was the most comprehensive book on Perriand. And The Sex of Architecture, a collection of essays presenting the diversity of women's views on contemporary architecture, edited by Diana Agrest, Patricia Conway, and Leslie Keynes Weisman. I also acquired and edited books on George Nakashima, Ray and Charles Eames, Laurie Anderson, and Julie Taymor, to name a few. After 11 years, I left Abrams and went out on my own. I began making books with architects, including Deborah Burke, Brad Klopfel, Moshe Safdi, working with museums, independent scholars, and others, including Metropolis Books, which eventually brought me on full time as a publisher. Metropolis Books was a unique collaboration between a magazine and a book distributor, namely Metropolis Magazine and DAP, Distributed Art Publishers. It was very new when they hired me, so I had the privilege of shaping the imprint. I'm gonna show you four of the books that we published. Thanks for the view, Mr. Meese, Lafayette Park, Detroit. Lafayette Park is a neighborhood in Detroit. It's one of the most successful urban renewal projects in the country. It's one of Ludwig Hilbersheimer's most important planning commissions, and it comprises the largest collection of buildings by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe in the world. But up until fairly recently, it wasn't widely known. The book opens and closes with these grids of photos, which were all taken by residents of Lafayette Park or by one of several photographers who shot series for the book. 
The photos you see here show the double story units called townhouses, glimpses of one of the three high rises and the park that knits the site together. This book is about present day life in Lafayette Park. Danielle Aubert, Lana Kavar, and Natasha Chandani are graphic designers who work together. They're interested in the way that places are experienced and represented. Danielle had moved to Lafayette Park and Lana and Natasha went and spent time there. They got to know the neighbors, the neighborhood, and the history of the place. And gradually their casual explorations turned into a full on research project, which eventually turned into a book that takes the perspective of the people who live there. This spread is from a section that features photos of residents in their living rooms, along with quotes of them talking about Lafayette Park. So for brevity, I'm going to refer to Danielle, Lana, and Natasha as the authors, but they really did almost everything. They researched and edited the entire book. They wrote portions of text for the book. They enlisted several local or visiting photographers to shoot series for the book, including the ones that we were looking at here, sorry. <laughs> they also tracked down all of the archival imagery. They invited a number of residents to write texts and they edited those. They conducted scads of interviews with residents. This one is with longtime resident Betty Brown, who was a super generous source of stories, information, photos, and ephemera, like the neighborhood newsletter that you see in the middle of this spread called the Lafayette Sporadic. We'll come back to that in a minute. And of course, given that the authors are graphic designers, they design the book. The organizing system for the book is pretty intricate and it grew organically as the authors wrestled with how to fit in all the different types of material that they had amassed. More than once when they sent me layouts, I'd noticed that a whole new category of material had sprouted up. The book has three main sections, the townhouses, the neighborhood, and the high rises. In each one, there are photo essays, essays, interviews, archive pieces, and one-offs like authentic and original, which catalogs a bounty of documentation from residents about original fixtures, fittings, appliances, like the drop-down cooktop shown open and closed, and materials like the vinyl asbestos floor tile. Another element the authors introduced was this, the sporadic, which recurs sporadically throughout the layout. Each installment is about a notable element of life in Lafayette Park, like the neighbors who gather regularly to chat and they call these manifestations the bench, or the hair salon, which is in one of the high rises. The neighborhood section of the book includes photos of the grounds crew residents' drawings and photos of bird life in Lafayette Park, celebrities rumored to have lived in Lafayette Park, among them Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, and Madonna, four one-mile walks to show you the variety of the landscape around the neighborhood, complete with maps, photos, and commentary. And in this series, portraits of residents in the high rises are paired with photos of the views out their windows. To me, what's so remarkable about this project is that it's a collectively generated autobiography of a place guided and shaped by three multi-talented young women. They brought curiosity, criticality, humor, and affection to their exploration of every aspect of life in Lafayette Park. And this comes through beautiful and really clearly on every page. Pardon me for one sec. Cape Cod Modern, mid-century architecture and community on the Outer Cape. Cape Cod Modern is equal parts architectural history, cultural history, and preservation story. It focuses on a number of dwellings, mostly single family houses that were built in the backwoods of two towns on Outer Cape Cod between the 1940s and 1970s. They're experimental, simple, utilitarian, and made of cheap off the shelf materials. And they generally weren't meant to last some were designed and built by self-taught artist architect builders, others by architects who, in the late 1930s, fled Europe for the US, including Marcel Breuer and Serge Tremayev and the engineer Paul Weilinger. These houses were generally unknown outside of those who lived in or visited them and a small circle of architecture experts. Also very little known was that an entire cohort of Bauhaus masters and students spent their first summer in the US on a little island 
at the base of Cape Cod. Here are a few photos from that summer of 1937. On the left, Walter and Isa Gropius. On the right, Santi Stravinsky, Gropius, Breuer, Herbert Beyer, and an American architect friend, Mary Koss. The authors of the book are Peter McMahon, an architect who lives on the Outer Cape, and Christine Cipriani, a writer based in the Boston area. Their beautifully co-written text is based on years of primary research, interviews with the designers and their families, friends, and clients. These same people provided a lot of the archival materials and original drawings you see in the book, which was designed by Rita Jules of McGinty Studio. This is a spread from chapter one, Architecture on the Edge, 400 Years of Building for the Moment, which sets up some of the themes that carry forward in the book. The lure of the spectacular and constantly shifting coastline, impermanence and adaptability, here you see a house being floated to a new location and the use of salvage materials from shipwrecks and salt works to build houses and other structures. We commissioned new photography by Raymond Koch and an architect who was working with Peter made new drawings of several of the houses that the book focuses on. You'll see some of those drawings in a moment. This chapter is on the Hatch House designed by Jack Hall in 1962. On the right, Here's Jack with his fictitious ancestor portraits that he painted, and on the left, a typical summer afternoon in the backwoods. Some of Jack's drawings for the Hatch House, archival photos lent by Jack's daughter, and more photos by Raymond Koch. Here's the preservation part of the story. By the 1950s, overdevelopment was threatening the Cape. Legislation was introduced in 1959 to create the Cape Cod National Seashore, a federal park that would freeze all future development inside a large area of the Outer Cape. While the law was being debated, over 100 houses were built within the future park's boundaries, including a small group of significant modernist buildings, including the Hatch House and the Paul Weidlinger House. When the legislation passed in 1961, the owners of these houses were bought out and the houses were slated for eventual demolition. Over the next couple of decades, the houses languished in bureaucratic limbo, most of them empty and deteriorating, like the Widlinger house. Here are some of Tom Dalmas's drawings. And here's the Widlinger house in ruins and restored. Peter McMahon formed a nonprofit, the Cape Cod Modern House Trust, to save some of these important houses by renovating them and repurposing them as a residency for scholarship, creativity, and public access. For most of the year, the houses are available to the public as rentals. Never built Los Angeles. Authors Greg Golden and Sam Lubell tell the origin story of the book in their acknowledgments. Quote, this book and an accompanying exhibition began in a warehouse deep in the San Fernando Valley. That storage facility contains models owned by the Getty Research Institute, some of which were designs meant for Los Angeles but never built, end quote. The Getty had invited the A plus D Museum in Los Angeles to do a show of the models. The museum enlisted Sam and Greg and the project grew from there and grew and grew. Sam and Greg did massive amounts of sleuthing and digging to unearth the re and research the projects and to locate all the images. They also committed to the intricate laborious process of co-authoring the text. Eric Hyman of Volume Inc. in San Francisco designed the exhibition and the book. He was very much an equal creative partner in the formation of this book, coming up with the graphic point of view that captures the expansiveness and the energy of Los Angeles. He started the wayfinding from high up in the air. On the opening spreads, he gave us details of maps from a few of the projects in the book. And here's the content spread. After a lot of debate, we decided to organize the projects by typology. So master plans, buildings, follies and amusements, parks and plazas, transit plans. Yes, transit plans. And as you can see, Eric continued to develop the system of mapping and wayfinding. This book is incredibly rich, so it was tough to pick only a handful of projects, but here we go. In Master Plans, we have this epic Civic Center project by Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright's son. Coming at the tail end of the City Beautiful movement, Wright proposed this Acropolis for the City, which would house City Hall, the Police Department, 
courthouses, a post office, and other civic agencies. It would have stretched from the central library all the way up to where the 101 is today. In buildings, we have Rudolf Schindler's prototype for mass produced prefab housing, building off of the modularity of his own house from the decade before. This was the 1930s, so he was hoping to get buy-in from the Department of Defense and the Department of Housing, but they didn't bite. He was a decade too early. After World War II, Eichler homes would begin dotting the Bay Area, as would Levittown's back east. Movie theaters, of course. This is in parks and plazas. We have this mind-blowing plan for a region-wide system of parks, playgrounds, and beaches by the Olmsted brothers, sons of the famed landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. It would have brought 71,000 acres of parkland to Los Angeles, strung along a 440-mile necklace. The plan also proposed that almost the entire coastline from Malibu to Long Beach be purchased and held, largely undeveloped, in the public trust. I'm not showing this, but on the next spread, there's a map of existing parkland in LA at the time. And it's basically like Griffith Park and a little green strip from Pasadena down to Elysian Park. So this plan really would have transformed the city. This mass transit plan from 1925, around the same time as the Olmsted Parks plan, called for a web of subways, elevated rail and surface rail radiating out from downtown and stretching from Long Beach to Santa Monica, up into the San Fernando Valley and east to Pomona. This was 100, almost 100 years ago. We did a whole subsection in transit plans to show all the various proposals for subways and elevated rail that were pitched between the 1930s and the 1960s. Here's an offshore freeway in Santa Monica. And to bring us into the 21st century, Stephen Hull's proposal for a total revamp of the Natural History Museum, a really sensitive architectural and landscape design that stalled due to lack of funds. So about midway through the making of Never Built Los Angeles, when we were really in the thick of it, Sam and Greg and I would be on the phone and I'd say, you know, we really should start talking about a Never Built New York. Dead silence or just a polite like, uh-huh. But Eventually we did it. So here's the last book, A Country of Cities, A Manifesto for an Urban America. Vashan Chakrabarti is the founder of POW, Practice for Architecture and Urbanism, and he's the Dean of the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley. By the time I met him, he'd already charted a highly diverse career path that included being director of the Center for Urban Real Estate at Columbia University, a partner at Shop Architects, former director of city planning for the borough of Manhattan and a former top executive on the Moynihan Station project at the related companies, but he had never written a book. A mutual friend introduced us, we met for breakfast and within two hours had agreed to collaborate. Our graphic design team fell into place just as quickly. I emailed Michael Beirut at Pentagram to invite him to design the book. He said, anything for Vashon, and that was that. A country of cities is Vishan's argument for dense transit-based cities. They're the solution to economic stagnation, environmental degradation, rising public health costs, and decreasing social mobility. To explain his case, he wrote a text and pulled together the images to go with. But there's a whole other side to this book. Vishan, a young researcher and a data visualization whiz kid, generated a hundred graphics to communicate a ton of statistics on issues relating to density, suburbanization, high-speed rail, the health impacts of automobile commuting, the racism embedded in the mortgage interest deduction, and much more. The message of this graphic is, the old version of the American dream is sinking us. It's time for a new model. This is the opener for section one, why cities are good. Section two is called how to build good cities. Average distances traveled by car for selected activities with Don Draper at large in a convertible. Pull quotes from the text are used for pacing. Hyperdensity leaves nature natural. A chapter about how cities affect health and well-being. Current work at, by shop. The advantages of mass transit and walkability. 
high-speed rail for America and high-speed rail funding China versus America. One thing I'm not showing here is that for many of these issues, there are multiple spreads of graphics that dig progressively deeper into a particular issue, which is really effective. The book ends with a manifesto for building a country of cities, smart urbanization and an infrastructure of opportunity. The final graphic is titled The Whole Enchilada. On the left, how to fund the infrastructure, at right, what we build, at bottom, the benefits, economic and social prosperity, environmental sustainability, and equal opportunity. To close, I leave you with this offering from a text by Broken Dimanche Press, also featured in publishing manifestos. It is important to always endeavor to have fun together. Generosity of spirit, thought, and ideas should permeate all activity. Thank you. I stop sharing now. Thank you, Diana. Um, so we will next hear from Rado Geyser. Um, let me introduce Rado. So Rado is an architect and a scholar with a focus on intersections between modern architecture, pedagogy, and media. He is Associate Professor of Architecture and Director of Undergraduate Studies at Rice University, where he teaches history, theory, and design. As a founding partner of the Houston-based design practice, MG & Co., Rado develops spatial strategies to accommodate objects that range in scale from books to buildings. The studio's work includes the installation Rooms for Books, featured at the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennale, and the exhibition design for Building a New, New World, realized in 2019 at the Canadian Center for Architecture. In 2005, Rado established the independent publishing platform, Stan Punkti. When it comes to books about architecture, Rado knows many roles, having experience as author, editor, designer, and publisher. His publications include Gideon and America, House is a house is a house is a house is a house. Reading Revolutionaries and Liberated Dwelling. The first English translation of Siegfried Gideon's 1929 book, Bifreitas Wonen, which will structure his talk today that he has titled Found in Translation. Rado? Thank you, Ashley, for the generous introduction. I'll share my screen. Um, let's see. Does this work? Um, yes, good? it's good. Mm -hmm. um, good morning, everyone out there in the Zoom void. It's, it's even a year later, still kind of always a bit funny to kind of um, not see the audience and I wish we could be all together today. Um, I'd like to thank Ashley and um, Adam for the amazing organization of this event for bringing um, this great array of people together. Um, and there are a whole number of people who engage me in conversations and projects that have shaped my thinking on architecture and bookmaking over these um, years. And, and they're far more than I can mention here, publishers, designers, architects, printers, and so on. Um, I will, though, single out just a few. I'd like to thank Luke Bullman, Solomon Frausto, Rachel Engler, who was um, uh, work, working, we were working together on, on the book that I'll present today. Um, Lars Miller, the publisher of that very book, and of course, also my partner at MG and Co., and also in life, Noemi Mollet. Um, I promised to talk about a specific book today, as Ashley mentioned, but it feels necessary to maybe step back just to, briefly at first to, to ponder what, um, what book, books mean today or what their, their futures might bring. We've been immersed in a full year, for a full year into this digital world um, and, and this conference, of course, included. Um, all of us have profited from the many ebooks and digital titles that are by now available to us. Um, and yet I'm convinced, as you will see later in my presentation, um, that print and post-print production are not mutually exclusive, but that they should be embraced as parallel modes of communication in a publishing environment defined 
by plurality of media. Futures of the book have been envisioned event essentially since the Romans first realized the codex. And um, with the dawn of the information age, this is um, an early kind of uh, customized book that I received uh, from my dad back in the day. Um, with the dawn of the information age and the related development of new technologies, the pace of such speculation has increased. And as a consequence, the death of the printed book has been loudly proclaimed again and again. The digital revolution made us believe that such devices as e-readers, mobile phones, and their impact on how we occupy and engage with public space um, are new, while in fact, the current present had been um, envisioned at least to some degree as early as 1894. In an essay entitled The End of Books, so back then, Octave Uzan pondered about a future of publishing in which text-based media would be entirely replaced by audio and information would be recorded rather than printed. And its consumption in transit would affect personal interactions and social protocol. All kind of rings a bell by now. New technologies have and continually are changing the publishing landscape, and yet the printed book has not disappeared. And just as the horse survived the 19th century, I'm convinced that the printed book will survive the 21st, even if in a changed role in, and in renewed configurations. While a global immersion in television and internet and the boundless dissemination of media and messages undoubtedly shapes the nature of communication today, the printed word persists. The recurrent prophecies of the book's end as a form equally fueled by anxiety and, ex and excitement are indicators of how definitions of the book itself have shifted significantly over time. Book history is media history. Um, new delivery mechanisms are fundamentally changing the dissemination of knowledge. Here, for example, the uh, um, the GUI, um, maybe James will elaborate on this. I don't know, I'm sure he's, he's gonna give you a kind of much deeper insight. Um, the shift from a physical book production to a digital delivery, for example, has introduced a whole set of um, spatial, legal, and cultural conditions that decisively determine the way we read, how we share information, and consequently, how we organize, structure, design, and distribute publications. And yet all technologies do not go away, but on the contrary, they assume new functions. Based on the conviction that digital publications will not only take over and obliterate printed books, but potentially produce them anew, um, I began to wonder how architectural knowledge um, and artistic production are disseminated in the global media context of social networking and other web-based um, interactivity. And uh, we gathered quite a few years ago um, to discuss some of that among an amazing group of people. Um, how do these recent modes of communication affect the world of publishing? While many publishers are still driven by the fear of becoming obsolete and seem to be primarily concerned with logistical and economic aspects of this transformation, we too often don't critically scrutinize why, where, and how we publish our works, I would say. Um, what are the advantages of uh, printed books? What are their limits? How can we take advantage of emerging technologies in order to create reading experiences that transcend the clumsy replication of the printed book in a digital format? There are qualities of a book, such as its assembly and binding, um, that we understand today as indispensable, but which were once completely optional furnishings added to publications by their respective owners. Books are subject to a cyclical evolution, one in which elements from the past can make a return once the stage is properly set for their reception. Well, for example, web pages are incompatible with the idea of a sequence and directionality as it is enforced through the codex, they have much affinity with the ancient scroll. Once designed as an instrument of oration um, and an aid in the verbalization of information rather than its visual digestion, the scroll is perfectly reflected in the narrative of the web page on which text is supported by various media that audiovisually represent the text to the user. All of this merely suggests that the choice of a particular medium 
has a direct impact on the reception of the message. And conversely, that we should be more specific in the choice of a particular type of publication dependent on what we want to convey. This might seem more than obvious, but still one repeatedly wonders why the printed book is still, at least in, in artistic and humanistic fields, the record of choice. Why, for example, and on the other hand, why, for example, works with an encyclopedic character are still printed and bound when they could be made accessible more conveniently and efficiently by means of searchable text formats. The described possibilities seem unlimited and it's definitely hard to argue against hypertext or the power of search engines. But what such explorations sorely reveal is the lack of an immediate material and haptic dimension of the book that is missing in, the digi in digital media and which many of us are still longing for. The book with its smell of fresh ink, the tactility of the paper, its durability, and its spatial and temporal qualities still seem to be a preferred medium for artists and architects to broadcast their ideas. But even if we leave sentimentalities aside, the paradox of the digital publication is that its configuration is shifting, dynamic, immaterial. In opposition to the printed book, the shelf life of which is extremely predictable, um, digital archives are fragile. They suffer the consequences of proprietary software, broken links, and bit rot. But beyond such questions as permanence and durability, the printed book bound in sequence has advantages that have manifested themselves in the past and still persist today. As an example of this, I will now shift gears and talk about a book that was originally published in the late 1920s, the heydays of experimental print culture, and, um, but then also its textual and visual translation into present time. So in the process of working on a research project on Siegfried Gideon, and while teaching graduate design studios on housing at Rice, it became apparent that one of the Swiss art historian and architecture critics most seminal texts, an 80 page manifesto entitled Befreites Wohnen or Liberated Dwelling, um, an image centered mass market book was sorely missing as a source available to English readers. It is one of the of only three of Gideon's books that remained exclusively accessible to a German speaking audience. F deeply familiar with Gideon's work and uh, fluent in, in um, both German and English, it seemed self evident to close this gap and translate um, this manifesto, which uh, I eventually did in a very close collaboration with my friend Rachel Engler. There are numerous reasons why Befreites Wohnen seem to serve to deserve another look. An early manifestation of modernist um, housing ideology, for example, it is a key to a broader understanding of the ambitions of the International Congresses um, of Modern Architecture, SIOM, and the debate on public housing at the beginning of the 20th century. Looking at Gideon more closely, it is also an important step in the context of his transformation from art historian to architectural critic. And the only publication that he himself, um, as an art historian, actually both authored and designed. But likely the most relevant for today's conversation, um, the Freitas Wohnen is based on a visual argument that manifests itself in the form of elaborate montages of newspaper clippings and handwriting and therefore poses challenging questions regarding um, a translation's visual adaptation and eventually also the medium selected to disseminate it. Befreitis Wohnen consolidates the line of thought established in uh, uh, an earlier book by Gideon entitled Bauen in Frankreich, Eisen, Eisenbeton, um, his first attempt to root modern architecture in a historical narrative. The book is probably his most, uh, if I just want, is probably his most um, polemical and also most political text. And it's shaped by a common belief that architecture um, should be more socially responsive and in tune with industrial progress and its effects on everyday life. And I think that's what really makes it kind of still so relevant almost 100 years later. The book is one in a lineage of many that took advantage of emerging printing techniques that made the reproduction of photographs significantly easier and also far more affordable. Instead of using images simply as uh, supportive illustrations for his writing, Gideon introduced photography as an inherent component of his argument. Illustrations did not provide evidence for his writing but operated 
as an independent dimension of the discourse, which marked the beginning of a reform of publications in architectural history. The principle of a comparative analysis of photographs based on simultaneous projection had been established in the academic context around the last decade of the 19th century, uh, among them Heinrich Wölflin, who actually happened to be Gideon's PhD advisor. Um, so while Gideon addressed, um, sorry, in extending this, this uh, approach of uh, kind of the gleichen the scene of a comparative vision, Gideon, uh, who is a decent photographer, um, created a visual language that surpassed the strength and the suggestion of his texts. So while he addressed the hurried reader um, as early as 1928, this is a spread from Bauen in Frankreich um, that he set up. And, and here you have the kind of preliminary remark, um, both in the English translation and the German original, where he kind of addresses the hurried reader. Um, he anticipated also later on that, and I quote, we cannot expect that everyone will read the books from the beginning to the end, unquote. If writers Wohnen, um, I would argue, is an intensification of this approach. Even if the book follows a clear separation of text on uncoated paper and plates on coated paper, as it was customary at the time and required also by this particular publisher, Gideon introduced dense collaged works with handwritten annotations on a number of pages. It is evident that the small volume was produced in haste and um, that it was meant to address a broad audience that was mostly unfamiliar with architecture. The series in which the book appeared um, called Schaubücher or look books, um, comprised of low price volumes targeted at non-specialist um, and non-specialist sort of broad um, general audience. They were produced in large print runs. The first edition of Befreites Wohnen was set at 12,000 copies. Um, that's about four times the run of a successful architecture book today, I would say. Um, the books were envisioned to be collectible yet practical volumes containing only brief texts and primarily based on a visceral visual argumentation and hence simultaneously educative and entertaining. Each volume adhered to a similar format, which was common for many photo books. Here you see three of them in the series. Um, an introductory essay was followed by an explanatory table of contents and the sequence of roughly 60 to 90 black and white photographs that were individually commented upon with extended captions. Gideon's text for Bifreitis Wohnen is at times eccentric, at others dogmatic. Inaccuracies, omissions, mistakes, and inconsistencies reveal the speed of the book's production. From its commission to the submission to the publisher, it was con conceived in less than four months. In some instances, names are misspelled and appear in various versions of um, and many of Gideon's sources are either incomplete or missing altogether. Perhaps these errors reveal something of the project's intended tone. Gideon's was in some ways a dogmatic undertaking, and in this he seemed willing to sacrifice certain kinds of academic accuracy for the bold claims of a pamphlet-like um, polemic. In the process of translating the text from German to English, it soon became clear that the challenge of translation was not just a linguistic question, but also a graphic challenge. And with it, the question what kind of publication medium would be most appropriate. Due to its collage-like character, many pages are packed with different types of information from photographs to newspaper clippings and handwriting, but also a whole array of different typefaces, including uh, the dominant grotesque characters, but also black letter and typewriter type. In haste, um, Gideon literally kind of, and I think I'm kind of ahead of myself here, um, sort of patched the book together with glue, as we will see in a later image. So at the outset, of that process, I began drafting some preliminary layouts under the somewhat blind assumption um, that the result would be a physical book that would capture the graphic essence of the original. And you can see here uh, one of these attempts and then another one in two colors. Um, these attempts are not unlike the translations of Otto Wagner's Modern Architecture or Gideon's own building in France, Iron Ferroconcrete, which was originally designed by Moholy Naj and then redesigned in its translation by Bruce Mao. Uh, both books, um, here's him 
gluing um, both of those books published by the Getty Research Center um, in a series called Texts and Documents that uh, has been running since the 1980s. While the consistent trim size of this excellent series of books does not reflect the diversity of the original publications, their design is centered on an accurate replication of the original layout, um, as we initially also attempted. This approach, however, comes with a number of fundamental challenges. First, because any English translation of a German text is shorter, potentially by around 20%. Different line breaks and fewer words um, will affect the layout. Second, typefaces used in the early 20th century varied locally. At the time of Gideon's public original, the, the Gideon's publication's original production in 1928-29, letter forms of a typeface could vary visibly, depending on the particular type foundry and depending on the printer, only certain sets of lead type um, would have been available. Several different typefaces were used for the Schaubücher series, so they're not consistent throughout. Uh, they're in the same tone, though. Uh, different printers were used. Um, and in the case of Befreitis Wohnen, specifically, galley proofs indicate such typographic inconsistencies with the production process of a single publication. So there are also slight differences um, among the kind of different editions that were run. Contemporary typefaces, though, based on the period originals, are quite different due to digitization processes and are often uh, new interpretations that combine characteristics of multiple versions of the same type family. It is therefore impossible to perfectly recreate lead type as it was used um, to print in the 1920s. The inaccuracies of the process, the mechanical impact on the paper, uneven pressure, and the inconsistent typesetting, literally, um, and inking of the letters all affect the graphic appearance of these books. This process and aesthetic cannot be reproduced in a modern lithographic process. So in response to these challenges, there's a brief moment in which a digital publication was considered, for it would have afforded us to animate te text, make annotations invisible when uh, desired. Um, here's some more kind of insights into, into the Getty series and this kind of uh, literal kind of translation of, of the, the, the English text into the original layout. Um, and um, so it would have allowed us to kind of make annotations and when desired offer a bilingual kind of interactive um, reading experience um, in many ways, maybe not unlike the linked by airs um, really interesting EPUB series archaeology of the digital that they produced for the Canadian Center um, for architecture, which I think is a is a is a really smart project. Um, but then there was also concern for the translations durability, the more sophisticated a digital publication. Um, gets the more vulnerable it essentially becomes to proprietary hard and software. And, um, and then of course there was also a desire to share the quality of the original object with a contemporary audience. Despite the large number of copies produced, I said before 12,000 just for the first run, the Freitas Wohnen was actually long out of print and since um, it, it was a mass market book. It was never really a collectible and it, is, it was hence really hard to find actual copies. So it was at this stage of the project um, in which um, my path crossed with the exceptional publisher and designer Lars Müller who visited Houston um, as part of a master class that I taught. He gave a talk and, and an avid champion of the printed book, the pendulum quickly swung back to some of the initial ideas. You see here a sketch uh, that Lars did um, in, the, in the process of these conversations. So in light of the previously discussed idiosyncrasies, however, we were um, determined not to replicate the original graphic form of the German edition in the book's English translation. In close dialogue with Lars, who has been republishing modernist books for three decades and who has an exceptional expertise in the graphic and material specificities um, of such publications, we decided um, to clearly separate Gideon's original publication as a facsimile reprint from its English translation and the commentary. The ambition was to replicate the first edition of Befreites Wohnen in a facsimile print that would reflect the period's um, materials as closely as possible under um, contemporary, under current um, production parameters. Liberated Dwelling, you see the original from 1929 on the left-hand side and the, the reprint that you can buy to the, like these days, um, the Lars Miller reprint on the right-hand side. Um, 
so the 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 liberated dwelling the the the, the pro the through that project, there's, there's this basically careful reproduction of the mass market book from the late 1920s, and that in itself is maybe curious. The team at Lars Miller Publishers engaged in a forensic study of the original book, researched production methods and materials to match the originals, the, the original as, as closely as possible. Um, since contemporary papers do not match the stock of the late 1920s, an available coated paper has um, as sort of different shades than the material found in the original publication. The pages were floated with a slight shade of ink to match the artifact as closely as possible. A close look um, reveals also limitations in the process of creating an affordable facsimile produced with contemporary binding equipment. The texture and color of the linen, for instance, is, is extremely limited and, and um, this kind of super fine linen on the original at the bottom um, is simply not available anymore today. The English translation, on the other hand, uh, we conceived as a separate volume, which you see here in red, um, to accompany the original text. The design of this complementary volume does not reflect the original design of the 1929 edition. Instead, each spread of the original book is reproduced as a vignette um, and annotated um, with the English text, a thumbnail. And I know um, Glenn is gonna talk about thumbnails. So, so um, more exciting stuff about that coming. Um, the facsimile of the um, original and the volume kind of containing the English translation and commentary work essentially like companions. Um, we saw this enriched republication as an opportunity to engage readers in a close reading of the text and its visual arguments. Because it was important to us that also small collage text fragments could be deciphered and matched with the original. We established a relationship between the facsimile and the translation by introducing those thumbnail spreads that you see here in the center um, of the image. Um, they would basically key in the English text and the notes. Spending numerous hours in the process of translating the many different text fragments assembled in this small volume forced us to look very closely. Um, and it revealed many hidden treasures that one tends to overlook in the course of a typical reading experience. A reading experience of images and of this kind of dense visual um, kind of aggregation. Separating the book into two volumes allowed us to drastically slow down the speed of reading to encourage a comparative method of based on the close examination um, of the original together with the translation and its annotations. Reading of the translation inevitably leads to discovery in the original. The book is a facsimile and as such, a most, obvious, most obviously a document of its time. But this project should not be understood as a nostalgic attempt to reenact a particular moment in history, both in terms of its argument and its form, Liberated Dwelling, is in my view, a book with contemporary relevance. The production of affordable and sustainable forms of dwelling is as critical today as it was in the late 1920s. The aspiration to realize mass produced housing and to take advantage of economies of scale was voiced almost 100 years ago and yet the construction industry at large still operates rather archaically. Standardized construction systems are still the exception to the rule. But the book is also interesting as a case study in architectural publishing. How do you communicate with lay people? How do you get their attention? Compact in size, it is a picture book that conveys a lecture-like tone and captures the attention of a large public. The Schaubücher series in which the book, which, in which Liberated Dwelling appeared, deliberately targeted a broad audience in order to educate the public about architecture, the arts, society, and technology. Whether manuscript, print, or hypertext, the book has only been able to progress through an intimate understanding of its vessel of communication and through leveraging the unique qualities of production. So even though conceived um, long before the pandemic and endless days of screen-based content dissemination, um, this excursion back to the roots of publishing and the related deceleration of time through print that forces us to sit down and compare two books next to one another seems, at least to me, um, in many ways, not only 
a relief, but also a confirmation, a relief from like being on screen all the time, but also a confirmation that even in a moment of a kind of plurality of media that the printed book still has um, what I would call its well-deserved place um, in, in the context of publishing. And I'll close here. Thank you. Oh, I got some more images. There we are. Thank you, Rado. Um, yeah. That was excellent. So at, at this moment, we're going to go ahead and open up the Q&A. Um, so anyone in the audience that has a question that they would like to send in, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And in the meantime, um, Adam, maybe you want to kick off uh, the questions? Uh, yeah. Um, I, why don't I start with a question um, uh, directed towards um, Diana. Um, I wanted actually, uh, Diana, to ask you a little bit more um, about how you developed your titles um, at Metropolis. Um, did the authors come to you? Um, how did how did how did you get it all happening? It's all over the map. It's every it's every conceivable way that you can imagine. I mean, from my very first book that I published was "Design Like You Give a Damn" with Architecture for Humanity, and I literally had. I just emailed Cameron Sinclair to say, hey, let's meet. And it turned out he was working on a book and we ended up publishing it. So the value of cold calling, cold emailing is still really valid. Um, um, Thanks for the view, Mr. Meese was really fun because Danielle and I had been introduced by a mutual acquaintance and she started telling me about this project they were working on when it was really just this amorphous like, they were in Detroit, in Lafayette Park and just, you know, kind of getting to know the neighbors and whatnot. And so she was kind of consulting me, like, what do you think about this? You know, could this be a book? And so periodically they would send me PDFs and it wasn't there yet. It wasn't there yet. It wasn't there yet. And then one day I got a PDF and I was like, wow, they did it. And you just get this feeling of excitement that, you know, they, they focused and they made it happen. And from there, the whole thing moved really quickly because as I described, they did so many of the aspects of the work themselves. Um, it came together pretty easily. Um, I can give you one more. Cape Cod Modern, um, Peter and I had been friends and he had done a little exhibition at the Provincetown Art Museum about some of these houses out on the Outer Cape. And he, they had published a little pamphlet. And so he came to me asking, how do we reprint this? But I knew he had also started doing a lot of research, like interviewing the architects who survived or their families or whatever. And so I started saying to him, you got more material here. You shouldn't just reprint this pamphlet. You should, you should start thinking about a book. And he probably rused the day that he ever said yes to me, but um, it turned out to be the book that you saw. Great. Yeah. Um, I have I have a question for for Rado. I, I mean, I would be interested to understand more about how Euphrates Wunen uh, came about uh, in terms of the translation version that you worked on with um, with Lars Mueller. But I, I think a more specific question that I'm interested in um, related to you know translation of content in the context of making book has to do with a comment you made about having uh, working with Lars Mueller and going through. A, a forensic investigation of the original 1929 publication, Gideon's original 1929 publication. Um, I, I wonder if you might want to share um, some, some nuances or insights into what that forensic investigation uh, it involved. Sure. Um, I mean, he started off by sourcing, sourcing some of the original books um, and and they were really hard to get. And we we I had a copy. Lars eventually got some, um, uh, and they were not all the same. That was another kind of interesting interesting thing that that th those series kind of were reprinted over and over, and and ads in them would kind of change over time. So 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 very very basic how that started. But then then. Um, uh, 
big question was essentially just kind of like to first first really was it was to kind of analyze how how are they made i mean it's clearly like the 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 first half which is on the kind of like fairly voluminous kind of uncoded paper was uh letter pressed as printing was normal at that at that moment so you you can also sort of sense the kind of um uh slight impression they're they're kind of they're fairly they're fairly i think affordably produced books at the time there are a lot of inaccuracies um in them um and and um so so we basically started to kind of look at what was there very closely and in a way like a, a lot of that happened already through the kind of um the actual kind of um linguistic kind of translation process like it forces you to look so much closer than you normally maybe would at the kind of um regular page um but it was essentially kind of diving in on this kind of level of materials and then and then and then the most challenging part really to kind of find contemporary materials that um sort of had similar properties and we're talking about 1929 1929 is um is uh th i think in 1929 materials are still okay but soon after i think s things started to kind of slightly deteriorate and and the way material is produced because of economic um, um reasons and the way papers were produced back in 19 uh, in the 1920s is very different of how papers are um produced now so and and, and Lars is really kind of determined to kind of to to make a facsimile that he could produce in an affordable way we know there are facsimiles that are produced like i don't know there are these companies that do facsimiles for for but for more um kind of for collectors reasons like i don't know facsimile of the book of kells and you name it that are that are hyper hyper accurate but the goal the challenge here was also to kind of maintain or, or to to continue to be able to kind of produce this book in an affordable way and that kind of really posed a challenge between this kind of idea of being as close to the original as possible but to still produce it on contemporary equipment and you will see binding for instance is a huge huge issue so the, the linens come in fixed colors and of course you can get linen produced in the color that you want but then that just kind of like skyrockets the price of what you're doing um standard binding is is done completely differently than it was done in the in the 1920s and so 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 you will for instance see and this probably doesn't translate here i wish i could show you both um but the, the it doesn't the way the way the kind of um linen goes goes stretches into the the kind of paper that's kind of um uh, laminated over it is much more kind of elegant and thin in the um original version um, because there was still a much more hand labor than there is nowadays. So machines kind of require more. And some of these, these translations were literally um, impossible. Same with the kind of aging effects. It was very hard to kind of get a sense of what the original tone of the paper was. And, and that's again where the multiple kind of copies of the original were relevant because some copies have been exposed to far more UV than others. None of the copies we had um, were kind of... Uh, lived in a kind of dark space for the time that they existed. So, so in many ways, there was also sort of, um, I guess, a bit of guessing where things would kind of roughly, roughly land. And certain, certain, like, as I mentioned, the kind of tone of that paper is simply not available. So, so um, Lars and his team were really sort of bending over backwards to kind of, um, to, to really try to achieve um, that, that very close kind of, um, look and feel of these booklets they're really they're really small and kind of um this background thing is difficult for that small and kind of handy and and cute and it's a great it's a it's a really great series um when what i've never seen um in in my experience making books is a set of shop drawings that uh might begin to define the the assembly of the the book as an object itself and just as you were talking about the linen and how it might meet the paper covering um it popped into my head that that could be an interesting exercise uh to pursue with with students or just you know on a on a rating sunday afternoon um have you ever done anything like that it's funny that you mentioned that i i don't think this happened in this in this particular case i have to say i i, no, I doubt it um i mean they're 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 fairly kind of clear, clear definitions of of how far you can go in negotiations with the printer. And and this is printed in Germany. And um, 
both us um, and Lars have been working with that printer for a very long time. And I think they're, they're, they're definitely sort of always willing to push the boundaries. That's, that's a crucial part, I think, of any, any book that you're making too, that you can work with, with printers who are actually willing to kind of engage the design ideas that you have, or in this case, to kind of translate something that they wouldn't do like that anymore into, into a, a contemporary context. But the, the, what your, your comment triggers is when we did Atlas of Novel Tectonics, Donald Mack and I, a uh, long time ago, uh, we knew that the book was printed in China and we couldn't be um, mm. there for press approval or we could even right. you know, see some of the production. So there we actually did um, fairly elaborate kind of um, drawings, um, diagrams of uh, how we kind of imagine things to be assembled. So it's a, it's a great it's a great point. I think it would be a fun, fun assignment for, for a, a class. Yeah, I think I might try it with some students this summer. Um, so a question for both of you, and maybe we can start with Diana, um, and then and then there is one in the chat for Rado later. Uh, how how did you come up, arrive to your career engaging with um, you know books and in, in media? Um, you know, Diana, I, in my introduction, I mentioned that you had began as a writer and an editor, and Rado is of course trained as an architect. Um, so I, I'd be interested to uh, hear from each of you about your trajectory. Sure. Um, I wanted to say, just to add to what Rachel was just saying, there's no substitute for going on press. It's so much fun and you really get to see close up round the clock what, and mostly it's men who are press men still in this day and age, but it's really fantastic working with the press men because you can just push and push and push and get things done that you just, you wouldn't be able to do normally just like on camera or anything. So big advocate for that. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was a literature major. Um, I graduated from college and this job opened at the Guggenheim and I applied, but it just, it instantly just captured my interest because I had loved writing and I had loved architecture. My father was an architect and that had a big impact on me. And, um, so I just kind of continued on that path. And he, I mean, those sort of models that I cited before, like Esther and, um, you know, Mike Davis and Denise, um, my dad was my first model because he was an architect and then he jumped ship and um, became an editor at Progressive Architecture Magazine. So I kind of saw how you could still pursue your love, but not necessarily stick to one path. And that I think really impacted me um, and it just kind of went from there. I mean, the Guggenheim was fabulous and just having your first job be in that museum was spectacular. Um, and then I just jumped, you know, when I went to Abrams, I learned a lot about contracts and acquisitions and it just all kind of built from there. Um, yeah, I, uh, as you mentioned, I was trained as an architect, I went to to uh, through a, a kind of very sort of typical rigid um, polytechnical kind of education, and after after my bachelor's degree, I I was getting a little I don't know I I, I I had certain reservations about it, and I was kind of looking for for something else. And it was this this year where we were uh, in, sort of um, where we had to do internships um, as a mandatory part of of the education in Zurich and. Uh, Bruce Mao had lectured at ETH um, that year before and um, I had a chance to interact with him there and then um, basically decided that I wanted to kind of um, or, or try at least to kind of um, be able to kind of work um, in his office and so I was fortunate to be able to do that and then stayed on for a moment and worked on a number of, of different book projects, but also environmental graphics projects. And that's really how I kind of um, got into bookmaking. So, so I, Bruce always said it was easier for him to train an architect in typography than a, than a graphic designer in space. Um, and, and we were a lot of architects in the office, curiously. And I really learned sort of the basics of uh, sort of the, the foundation of typography in, in, in that office and, and a particular type of approach to editorial bookmaking and that has has um has had a significant impact on my 
on my path. And, and later on, um, I think through my work, through my work in, in academia and also uh, curatorial work, um, books always kind of, I, I think were, were part of, I was, of what I was doing, but, but quite often in different roles. And I think that has tremendously helped me um, uh, to, to in, in many different ways. I, I think um, my own book, uh, Gideon in America, would not look as it looks if I didn't understand the processes behind it, but it would also not look what it looks if I actually designed it. And I'm glad that I didn't and that I had the opportunity to work with terrific graphic designers. And, and, and I also always knew where I had to let go and give them the space that they needed. And, and we were lucky to have a publisher who was willing to kind of let me communicate directly with the, the graphic designers. And, and in other instances, um, I operated as the editor. And I think, again, working with graphic designers there, I think it helped me to, to have been in the role of the graphic designer myself and kind of um, uh, sort of really kind of to be involved in that kind of um, collaboration. So I think, it's, I think it really sort of, at the end of the day, every book project is a kind of major collaborative endeavor that starts maybe with the author or the designer, um, the architect, but that kind of culminates at the end also with the, the, the printmakers, the, 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 all the different kind of craftspeople that are involved and have to be kind of as engaged um, in that process, um, the lithographers, you name it. Yeah, I wonder if, if Glenn has any comments on that um, or in terms of, especially your, your note that you, at, at certain points you need to know when to let go and let the designer do their, their thing and not try to control everything um, as an editor. Definitely, in my experience, it's definitely a conversation. It's best when it's a conversation because in the same way, sometimes it's great to let go and see what the graphic designer thinks. There's also moments where you, you don't want to do what the graphic designer thinks, you know, like that's the, um, like, so you want to have some back, the ability to kind of have some back and forth with that. Um, like, like anything, different people bring um, different levels of vision and expertise to the project. And so, designers are going to kind of have their eye on one aspect of it that's that in, often in a productive way isn't um, hasn't spent five years developing the content of the project so they can they can see other things uh, structural things or kind of ways of doing stuff that you might not be able to but it, but it, but you know again it has to be a kind of dialogue back and forth is my experience I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. I think the best books come out of when you're, you're all functioning <laughs> like a crew and it's really that sort of collaboration and creativity and community. Oh, sorry for that alliteration, but it's just, it's, it's the best when you're all just in there together, sharing ideas and knowing when to compromise and et cetera. So there's, um, one more question that in the chat that I, I want to make sure from, from Megan Pye uh, is asked to Rado, and then we should probably take a brief break before the next session begins. So Megan asks, um, external from the considerations of material translation, how do you consider the methods of distribution that are possible for varying media formats? What translation should take place here, if any? Distribution as literal distribution. This is this is again the sort of like being in that Zoom room, not being able to make eye contact with the person who asked that question is it's always a bit hard. Um, I, I'm not sure if I if I if I will respond to it the 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 way it's meant, but um, I mean if we think about distribution, of course, uh, the, the 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 kind of traditional the physical book has clearly. It's challenges, and I think, as we all know, who have been involved in publishing distribution, is essentially the, the the kind of key, one of the key components that the publisher brings in. That's 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 the kind of the, the bottleneck at the end of the the day. I think um, we can kind of collectively make books, but then the question is, how do they actually um, reach the world? How do, do they reach an audience? And I think, um, given that they're less and less 
bookstores and less and less platforms that actually kind of um, provide uh, an opportunity for those books to be sold, um, that becomes more and more difficult. By now, it's pretty much cultural institutions like the Guggenheim or the Graham Foundation, or you name it, uh, the Manila Collection here in Houston, who who run bookstores that don't have to be super profitable, probably in average, or that profit from some real estate that's around that they can use. Um, and and so so that's become definitely difficult. And on the other side, you have like um, uh, the big online. Uh, sales platforms that um, I think are brutal for publishers in terms of the kind of conditions that they 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 offer. So on that end, I think uh, digital distribution is of course uh, super productive. And 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 I mean, I don't know what we would have done in terms of our scholarship if we had no access to kind of digital sources um, this past year. Yet it's only a fraction and if all of our scholarship were just based on that i think that would be really kind of limit limiting and sad as well and the other problem is that we can we can i think what 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 we haven't really fully kind of accepted is that uh, websites deteriorate digital publications deteriorate um uh, as much as you have to kind of keep a book in in in, in particular conditions to to keep it over hundreds of years, um, you have to maintain all this kind of digital information. And while it's fast to distribute, um, I think it's extremely challenging to kind of keep these um, records up and and productive and available. And and so so there's also a downside to that. But depending on what one wants to do, I think yes, uh, it is definitely. Uh, a kind of uh, an interesting way of, of reaching a really, really broad audience. Though I also wonder, I mean, this is recorded. Everything that we do these days is recorded. And I actually kind of wonder myself as much as everything is also instantly transcribed and kind of out there too. And I wonder who is at the end actually going to kind of watch, read and process all of this, right? And the book, I think... Like at the end of the day, there's an editor, there's someone like Diana, there's a there's a publisher, there's um, like James, there's 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 like there's a designer who kind of spends a lot of time kind of giving it form, interpreting that, making it so that you can kind of um, comfortably read it and and have fun with it. And I think there's there's this whole sort of um, there's a lot that goes into it to kind of create a, a, a particular. Um, experience, and I think um, it's not to be it's not to be underestimated. And I think it will it will it will still draw people to kind of processing information that way. It will. If I could just jump in, it's we didn't even talk about what happens after the books get delivered to the warehouse. You know, the reception and the introduction of the book out into the world is the most exciting part. Whether you like organize a formal launch or just the converse, you know, the reaction starts. I mean, one of my favorite moments in publishing is when authors or friends start sending me photos of my books out in the wild. I mean, it's just great, you know, like a bookstore in Pike Place in Seattle, or I mean, literally, you know, Rwanda, or I mean, that's just, it's so gratifying to see affirmation that your books are getting out there. It's really, really important. All right, well, thank you, Rado and uh, Diana. Um, I appreciate thank hearing you. your reflections on the, the processes and the issue of uh, you know, reception of material, translation of material, and getting it out there into the world. Yeah. So the, um, the next session, which uh, we're, we're actually right on time, that's kind of amazing, uh, is going to, to begin with uh, James Graham. Um, James Graham is an architect, historian, and assistant professor at the California College of the Arts, who previously was the director of Columbia Books on Architecture in the City and founding editor of the Avery Review at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation. James practices and writes about architecture's discursive forms, whether as ed editorial platforms or experiments in digital and print publication. His dissertation, Psychotechnical Modernism, Architecture, Design, and Occupational Therapy, 1914 to 1945, received the Graham Foundation's Carter Manny Award in 2017. Other ongoing research projects include the intersections of agriculture and nationality with constructivist architecture in the Soviet Union and the architectures of coal extraction in Appalachia. His work has been published widely in scholarly journals, online platforms, and edited 
volumes. Um, James's talk is entitled Materializing Discourse. James? Hey everyone, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, here it is, and here it is. You're you're seeing my title slide correctly. Okay, we good. So we also see oh, your browser. Oh, oh, but, shoot. Um, then tell you what. Let me do this differently. I'm sorry. Uh, I will reshare. reshare. And Thanks. sorry. You still got the browser? We've got it. We can probably um, ignore it if if that's a problem. Um, you know, let me just let me do it one more time. See if it goes differently when I do. Wait, hold on. How's that? Is that browser? Tools? Yes, that's good. Excellent. Great. Apologies. Sorry about that. Um, so. What a pleasure it is to be here with you, uh, with these really fantastic folks uh, who are doing such interesting work. Thank you uh, uh, to the organizers for this, um, for this day and for all of you for being here on a Saturday. Um, I'm super delighted to be here uh, in part to pick up on some uh, sort of ongoing conversations with friends and colleagues and starting uh, some new ones. As mentioned, my talk today is going to be about materializing discourse, or to use another phrase that my students will have heard me say way too many times, the frictions of making discourse material. Uh, like many other folks here, I'm coming to you as somebody with grounding in publication practice as an editor and publisher, but I'm also coming to you as an architectural historian with an interest in the media of architectural discourse. And so my talk today is based uh, on a course that I've taught a number of times uh, on architecture in print. And the argument of the, the course is honestly, uh, I think a pretty obvious one, uh, that the horizons of what we know about architecture, at least within the sort of enlightenment epistemologies that, that privilege certain ways of knowing architecture, are to a really important extent uh, defined by the tools that we have to put it all down on paper. and. Furthermore, the, the, uh, the way we produce architecture, the way we produce buildings is in turn uh, deeply informed by the ways that we know architecture. Uh, and so in teaching this class on architecture and print, my, my hypothesis is that you can triangulate between the emergence of new printing techniques, uh, new perspectives on architectural representation, and then new building practices, that the mechanics of print can literally be traced into uh, the built objects themselves. So let's see if I can convince you of that uh, over the next few minutes. And the, the extremely short history that I'm about to, to share will likely be a, a familiar one, perhaps even an elementary one. I'm drawing on a lot of texts and thinkers that I think you might already know. And I'm also going to be telling you a little bit about how some of printing works or, or worked, uh, which at least with my students is sort of like I'm explaining like what a VCR was or, or something. And before I get into it, I wanna share one uh, further wrinkle, which is that I've been teaching a seminar this semester on spaces of extraction. And in the seminar, we've been challenging ourselves to attend to the ways that the field of architecture shapes and is shaped by uh, various processes of extraction. Uh, most obviously in the fact that architecture involves uh, making decisions about how to distribute labor material and energy. Uh, each of which is clearly tied to a sort of extractive economy. And so in, in that spirit, in the spirit of this challenge that I'm putting to my, my students, I, I also wanna try and offer some provocations about how the history of architectural print is not simply about knowledge production, uh, but about knowledge extraction, which is to ask how the sort of physicality of print discourse might play a role in the sorts of uh, modes of canon making and colonial knowledge structures that still trouble our field today and indeed trouble our publications. So that's the preamble. Uh, I'll, I'll get to the slide and there, there will be a couple 
uh, uh, minor uh, repeats from uh, Reto's fantastic talk also. I, I think I'm uh, picking up on a few of these, these same threads. The origin story of architectural publishing that, that I received certainly was uh, Vitruvius's 10 books. Uh, the fact that we still know what Vitruvius might have written uh, back in the year 30 BC or so uh, is thanks to the scriptorium of Charlemagne um, in the early 9th century where monks would undertake the work of copying out surviving manuscripts from antiquity. And I, I, I want to marvel momentarily at this particular uh, friction in the transmission of knowledge and to think about how much was lost along the way. If these Carolingian monks were the, the technology, uh, so to speak, that painstakingly copied Vitruvius um, into our canons, uh, then we might also think about the, uh, the, the worldviews, the suppositions, the linguistic expertise and, and so on um, that led them to curate these manuscripts um, and not others uh, that they transmitted to the present. Uh, these uh, uh, sort of Vitruvius uh, images are found in the Harley collection of the British Library. It was actually one of the founding collections of the British Library, which uh, will sort of be relevant uh, uh, later in the talk. And the script is uh, a Caroline minuscule. The, the diagram that you're seeing there is a, a diagram of the winds. So here's another copying of Vitruvius that took place around 1390, along with some interpretive drawings. Uh, many of y'all will remember that Vitruvius had an elaborate theory about how climate determines race. And so this text is one in a very long line of texts that posited certain links about uh, architecture, climate, and racial superiority, which uh, in turn got baked into later Enlightenment ideas uh, about the same, about climate, architecture, and race. So by the time we get to the first printed uh, translation of the Trivia's De Architectura, which was assembled by Cesare Cesariano uh, in, in 1521. This primarily textual document, because uh, of, of the sort of copying of the, the oral tradition of the monks, had acquired some woodcuts along the way, uh, including this uh, particular take on the idea of Vitruvian man. You, you might be more familiar with the uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, rendition of the same. So the woodcut uh, became inserted into the space of movable type, which suddenly meant that the distribution and thus the preservation of text enters a, a very different mode um, than of what I was showing before. So then the argument, and this would be the, the canonical, argu canonical argument, would be that the nature of discourse at this moment was largely text-based, that it gave rise to a particular form of writing. Uh, that form of writing was the treatise, and that the treatise in turn brought on a particular sensibility about how architecture is transmitted and judged uh, through a set of written uh, principles. And there were of course occasional woodcuts sprinkled in uh, which operate within the flat space of, of wood carving, even if that flatness was sometimes cast into three dimensions by linear perspective. But what this European discovery of the printing press, discovery, uh, obscures is the extent to which architecture had been a mode of print communication for quite some time, particularly in China, where mass produced woodcuts on architectural techniques uh, were already uh, spreading fairly widely in the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, and I want to note again uh, that, that, you know, here in these particular images, uh, I, I think the sort of parallels between the techniques of wood cutting for the purposes of the printed page and the technique of wood cutting for producing architectural details, both as a sort of mode of, of communication uh, through the hand and the wood, exist here in a sort of interesting and productive tension. So you might uh, think, well, you know, Chinese characters might lend themselves to woodcuts in a different way than an alphabet-based language. Uh, but no, in fact, there was, oops, uh, well, my side's slightly out of order. Uh, there was in fact movable type in the Song Dynasty, um, sometimes made in clay, sometimes made in wood. So perhaps we could uh, argue instead that if anything, uh, the string of letters that constitutes uh, Romance languages, for example, uh, are what was more clumsy uh, for the sort of introduction uh, of movable type. Uh, so architecture didn't necessarily need the printing press to become a discourse. Uh, and as I said already, architectural knowledge was spreading uh, even as early as 500 BC through these kind of woodcuts. 
uh, Lu Ban was a famous Chinese structural engineer. Um, and of course, uh, along with these uh, woodcuts, um, uh, knowledge was circulating through oral traditions, through guilds, through craftspeople, um, and so on. This is a page from the Lu Ban Jing, which is a, a sort of collection of the architectural theories of Lu Ban. Uh, and this particular page speaks to um, how architects might build in uh, auspicious or perhaps non-auspicious uh, uh, aspects to their building uh, uh, in, in terms of their attitude toward their clients. Uh, literally, there's a section about the non-payment of, of uh, architectural fees and what you might do with your building um, uh, when that, that takes place. And so I think it, 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 these images to me uh, speak to the ways that uh, there are other versions of architectural knowledge that enter the space of print discourse than the ones that are privileged by the canon making of what the European mind understood uh, as print discourse. All of which is to say, I think we're missing something if we think of 1450 as the sort of origin uh, moment uh, for architectural uh, print discourse. Um, I, but, you know, things change for sure. And I think it's worth asking about the ways in which perhaps uh, the sort of uh, moment of European printing was in some ways a moment of closure about what constitutes a discourse on building uh, as much as it was a sort of opening. So here are three things that happened around 1450. Uh, and I want to argue that they're deeply interrelated. On the left, uh, you have the, uh, uh, the movable type of Johannes Gutenberg. On the center, you have the codification within the field of architecture of linear one point perspective, bringing three dimensional space into the, the flat space of the page, um, a sort of mathematical way of constructing the appearance of that space. And then on the right, you have the first uh, kind of uh, global map um, drawn by the Venetian Fra Moro, which is uh, in fact actually a very accurate, uh, surprisingly accurate depiction um, of, of the, the planet once you get your orientations uh, right. So all of these were systems of knowledge that rely on being reproducible. Uh, they communicate uh, not directly, but through the dissemination of media. They each understand the world as a sort of gridded space, the idea that you can assign things to sort of points within a, a Cartesian space. And it's those three things, the printing press, uh, the rise of architectural representation and the new sense of globality uh, that come together, I think, to give rise to this idea that architecture is a discourse in a sense that has stayed with the field for quite some time. Uh, Reto uh, alluded to uh, the sort of anxieties around uh, the, the book, the death of the book and uh, the death of the building. Um, I will trot out the, the sort of cliche of these conferences uh, and uh, Victor Hugo's idea of this will kill that. Um, uh, the, the printing press in essence killed architecture, the book will kill the building. Uh, why does this take place? Um, he argues that before the printing press, uh, buildings themselves were the repositories of human history, like literally memory is inscribed on them through markings and narrative imagery, and simply through the endurance of the material itself. Um, I won't uh, read, read the, uh, the passage here, but with the printing press and the ability to produce text in quantities, all of a sudden the book becomes the more durable monument, uh, the, the, the argument goes, because you can... Uh, you know, Notre Dame de Paris might uh, burn down, but you can never burn every copy of a book. And so that becomes a question for architects, right? Can architecture act as a memory storage device? Maybe. Here are two French projects from right around the time that Victor Hugo was writing, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which is the preeminent architecture school, of course, of the 19th century, where the architecture is, is literally comprised of these kind of uh, moving fragments. I mean, I, I read this plan almost as a kind of movable type of sculptural ornament, uh, or of course the library of Henri Le Bruce, which becomes a sort of communication device by listing its authors on the facade. But by and large, it was not building that came to store time so much as print um, for being the sort of primary expression of cultural uh, memory. Uh, Print culture becomes the way that architectural travels, and the book becomes the way uh, that we begin to think about architecture in different ways. The book being a technology that to some extent transcends uh, time and space. So it's no accident that this first engraving of a print shop, which uh, dates to 
1499 is is portrayed as a sort of dance of death these kind of ghouls like working against the the ravages of time to preserve knowledge so here's one of those uh gutenberg bibles um on the left i i, I think it's fascinating because you see it's straining to be like the illuminated manuscripts uh, of, of the monks. Uh, so you would produce these woodcuts and you would still sort of alter them in small ways by hand, even with the movable type. So you see all of the efforts uh, at sort of not recognizing uh, the realities in some way of this new uh, mode of printing. And of course, what gets written in roughly the same year, that's Alberti's uh, On the Art of Building, which is the first a uh, text um, in the sort of Western tradition to really codify the architectural profession, marking the split between builder and architect. And what is it that defines that split? Uh, the split is produced by architectural representation, the idea that we communicate through drawings rather than uh, necessarily through building itself. This is what makes architecture a discourse. And as you know, it was about 18 years earlier than that that Alberti first sort of codified some of his particular rules of linear perspective in, in his book, De Pittura. Here it is rendered by Albrecht Dürer, the idea of perspective as a kind of window uh, that translates three-dimensionality into two. So perspective is replicable like, like print. Uh, Elizabeth Eisenstein has argued that the mechanical reproducibility of type put pressure on other manual arts to be similar. So I, I, I'll sort of follow her in proposing that perhaps um, this mode of drawing is, is turning uh, space into something like uh, a print discourse. What's interesting uh, about some of these devices, which I love, uh, that are about uh, sort of mapping uh, perspective um, onto the space of the page, um, is that these methods require uh, multiple people, particularly the one on the left, where uh, one of these surveyors calls out a set of coordinates to the other who sort of uh, takes it down on paper. And it, I find this a very uh, appealing image because it speaks uh, to how architectural knowledge was rendered as a sort of transmissible thing. It was abstracted into communication and could be passed to somebody else. It didn't matter who was on the sort of other end of the pen, uh, if you will. I think this is one way very much of understanding the sort of modernity of print discourse. So these uh, sort of figures exploring a uh, perspective using these kind of strings that pull back to their, their eyes seem innocent enough, but I also wanna highlight the idea that space is mastered through making it knowable uh, and that it can be transmitted in the absence of the original, which makes it a sort of distinctly colonial mode of seeing. As Mabel Wilson and others have argued, uh, it's no accident we call our history sequences surveys, um, a term that points to the, the sort of colonial scope of supposedly global or civilizational knowledge. And I love this uh, drawing on the right by Abraham Bossa in particular, because fittingly enough for my argument, he was a printer. So we're now sort of plunging into the 17th century where these new techniques of printing uh, started again, changing the nature of architectural discourse. The lines of perspective are the lines of the metal plate engraver. This is a mode of printing known as intaglio. If uh, the woodcut sort of works um, uh, through relief where you remove uh, the parts that, that you don't want. Intaglio worked where you etch the plate with the line that you do want. You fill the plate with ink, you wipe the ink off, and then you run it through a press. So you're sort of, uh, there's a kind of positive negative relationship between the change from woodcut to intaglio, which allows a much greater precision of line work um, and a much sort of finer, finer scale of representation which means the intaglio changed the nature of how architecture could appear in print. Um, so if the woodcut requires linear perspective through vanishing points, the fine line work of intaglio opens up new possibilities so you can capture three-dimensional surfaces through relief. Uh, you can't get this kind of detail in, for example, an Alberti style woodcut. Some of you will have anticipated my polemic here. Uh, these are the so-called Elgin marbles, which were removed from the Parthenon and now reside in the British Museum. The, these are objects of an intense repatriation campaign. So if the taking of cultural artifacts, like physically, uh, is clearly one mode of a sort of uh, discourse extraction, uh, I think it's interesting to think about what the sort of circulation of print images means. Um, is it related to the same kind of forms of uh, epistemic violence or are they innocent of these conditions? I think these are sort of uh, questions worth contemplating. 
or take the Rosetta Stone, another uh, artifact in need of repatriation. It was discovered uh, during the exhibitions of uh, expeditions, sorry, of Napoleon Bonaparte in Egypt around 1799. Uh, and this expedition was of course a military endeavor meant to expand French interests in Egypt, but it was also an academic endeavor, one that uh, was meant to document uh, the architecture, the arts um, of Egypt. Um, and so the print uh, forms that emerge from this, particularly in the sort of colossal book, uh, the description of Egypt from the early 19th century, which at the moment was uh, absolutely one of the sort of great projects uh, in architectural print. And you can see uh, on the right, the sort of uh, invention of these kind of colored uh, copper plate engravings. And so, you know, Intaglio opens up to the possibility of transmitting architectural knowledge through things like the Grand Tour, that Enlightenment interest in the architectures of Greece and Rome, uh, and so on. If you're going to pick an architecture to represent this, it might be Sir John Stone's house um, in London, the idea of gathering and reassembling uh, uh, transmitted fragments. And of course, uh, Piranesi, I, I want to signal, is another one of these famous uh, Intaglio artists who is both a sort of a documentarian. Uh, rather than documenting uh, antiquity in its ideal condition, uh, in, instead in the sort of condition as it, as it sat. Uh, or also using intaglio to imagine new modes of architectural experience. And so I think the sort of materiality of this particular uh, kind of mode of working metal is I think crucial here. The next step I'm gonna speed up radically uh, around 1850 was lithography, litho meaning stone. And so the way it worked now was instead of the sort of carving of metal, you would use uh, oils that would separate uh, uh, the sort of ink from non-ink and you would cover them. Uh, and I sort of note that the, the irony that this moment of advance beyond the metal plate uh, of printing uh, uh, was also the moment of a sort of heightened place for cast iron in architecture. And so here color enters architectural discourse in an even more radical way, sort of opening up the archeologies of the Grand Tour, always in black and white, uh, to new sites uh, for European exploration, Islamic Moorish architecture, and so on. And so the point that I'm trying to drive home, of course, is that the frictions of making these architectural images, the kind of difficulties in the inventions, help determine what kind of conversations uh, we would have about architecture. For Owen Jones, who produced this sort of uh, grammar of ornament that, that went along with uh, his sort of uh, work in the invention of chromolithography. Uh, it means understanding architecture as something like a grammar, uh, a set of interchangeable parts that communicate in particular ways like type. And it, Jones, uh, of course, uh, also thought that the age of cast iron, which is again stamped out serially in the mode of movable type, uh, meant that you could uh, sort of understand this new cast iron architecture as a sort of alphabet of ornaments, uh, a kind of flat ornament, as he called it. As the 20th century progresses, and now I'm going to pick up steam even more radically, uh, a lot of these questions remain in many of the sort of uh, canonical uh, sort of engravings and images uh, of 20th century modernism, the struggle for color printing uh, is in some ways the struggle for utopia, as in the case with uh, Bruno Taut's uh, interest in glass architecture and uh, colored glass sort of casting a different image of these resolutely black and white uh, representations that print discourse often produced. This was of course also the age of photography, something that Reto covered very nicely. And his photography had been around of course for a good bit of the 19th century, but uh, the work of projecting a uh, 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 sort of dot screened uh, matrix to make the photograph enter the space of print rather than a kind of photographic substrate uh, was one of the very particular frictions. Um, you're very familiar, I think, with the effects of dot screening uh, today. And these sorts of images, uh, for example, the canonical images of American industrial buildings become important as circulating objects within uh, uh, modernist architectural imaginations. Uh, and of course, um, uh, photolithography, uh, as, as uh, Reto already mentioned, enables imagery to become ever more integrated onto the page, a sort of new materiality of images, printers, marks, and movable type. 
buildings themselves began to circulate and become uh, sort of canonical, uh, viral, if you will, in a particular way. Architecture uh, as, as a sort of design discipline becomes acutely aware of the power of photographic imaging and the incorporation of photographic imaging into all kinds of other media, print objects, exhibitions, uh, so on. Or uh, photography opened up, uh, moving later into the 20th century, uh, new modes of spatial research. Uh, photography became a sort of um, almost uh, anthropological mode of seeing a uh, sort of non-judgmental view on uh, the city as it was. This is, of course, Ed Ruscha's uh, very canonical Every Building on the Sunset Strip, which was a sort of incredible object of print materiality in and of itself. Um, as Diana already mentioned, this feeds absolutely, I think, into uh, the work of Denise Scott Brown, uh, as well as Robert Venturi on learning from Las Vegas, uh, the idea that um, uh, these sorts of modes of uh, reproduction enable new methods of architectural research. The rise of the risograph in the 1960s, which was a sort of smaller and more portable version of, of a printing machine, uh, opens up a new kind of uh, uh, accessibility of print media, uh, opening itself onto countercultural visions. Um, uh, a risograph is it's it's kind of like a a screen printer for print in a way where you would uh, have these screens that would then you would sort of feed different inks into them. Offset printing enabled a new vividness, of course, to enter architectural discourse. I've always loved this particular image of Archigram's walking city because it shows all the, the, the crop marks, right? It shows all the sort of preparatory materials that it takes to insert these images that are probably ingrained in most architects' uh, consciousness into uh, the space of the page. Or uh, you could even talk about the Xerox in the 1980s, a sort of consumer technology with its own particular regime of visuality, um, a medium uh, that seeped into architectural theory uh, through uh, texts like uh, uh, Shumi's Manhattan transcripts or early Diller's studio drawings, which when I was an undergraduate student, we would go to great lengths to figure out how to sort of photocopy our drawings to kind of reproduce uh, this particular uh, uh, aesthetic regime. I can't resist this mock-up made by Seth Siegelob for an art catalog known as the Xerox book. And I find it irresistible for two reasons. Firstly, uh, because again, the, of the reminder of how relatively recently we were still doing these kind of complex uh, paste-ups. And secondly, because of the extreme irony that it ended up being too expensive to actually Xerox the entire book. And so this most sort of famous uh, Xerox oriented publication uh, ended up being offset printed for uh, cost purposes. And almost at my closing slide, I think it demands us to ask similar questions about the digital. Um, here's the incredible Muriel Cooper at her three screen workstation. I love this image because it reminds us of just how material and full of friction digital production still is. And so that would be my sort of short history of print. Here we are in our own period of RGB screens, CMYK inkjet and laser printing which I think surely has its own effects on the production of architectural knowledge and architectural theory, which um, I would enjoy us to all sort of speculate about together in our work. Uh, so thanks a lot. Sorry for running a little bit over. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, uh, I've had a sign in issue. Um, someone else from Pratt SOA has signed in. Can you guys hear me still? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I guess you can't see me. We cannot see you, unfortunately, but we can definitely hear you. Okay. Um, well, we'll have to figure out that, that technical problem. In any case, we, since we're uh, moving on. Yeah. Uh, Adam, I think you're going to introduce Glenn and maybe I can resolve this before the next uh, question answer. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Jane. Yeah, James, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating talk. I have a lot of questions. Uh, um, yes, let me introduce um, our, um, our fourth uh, speaker today's symposium. Uh, Glenn Cummings um, is a graphic designer, creative director at MTWTF, um, uh, his firm where he collaborates with a wide range of clients to translate complex content into engaging experiences and objects. Um, Glenn operates as an editorial advisor and a designer, driving narratives that shape MTWF's response to current topics and concerns. Some of his recent publication work include uh, Towards an Urban Ecology, Kate Orff 
escape, uh, low-tech objects and operations. The revolution will be stopped halfway, Oscar Niemeyer in Algeria uh, by Jason Adi, amongst um, many others. Uh, Glenn has served at, uh, on the Yale University School of Arts faculty from 2002 to 2013. Um, he's taught at MIT School of Architecture and Planning um, in New York. Uh, Glenn um, has engaged with the design community as vice president of AIGA New York, um, as a fellow of the Design Trust for Public Space, uh, and as a critic um, at many design architecture and planning programs. So without further ado, I would like to pass the virtual stage to Glenn Cummings. Okay, let's see if we can, uh, can make the sharing work here. Hold on a second. Find my button. Okay, so you guys are probably getting the whole thing. Let's see if I go, um, just gonna, stop it and do it a different way. Almost there, almost there. Oh. We're almost there. Let's see. look full screen now? Yes. Okay, excellent. It's working. Um, so thanks for, um, thanks for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate um, in this larger conversation. So, so the talk, oh, the talk I'm gonna give is, is called Thumbnails. Uh, when Ashley originally reached out and gave me some information about the, uh, what the theme of, uh, of the symposium was, I thought it would be good to be literal and to literally be about print and to be about scale. So, uh, so I started to kind of put together some ideas and this is the one I kind of wound up developing. So um, maybe I'll just read in a really brief statement and then I'm gonna, um, and I'll kind of talk you through some stuff. So uh, thumbnails are the small representations of pages in publication and viewing app and publication design and viewing applications used to view, navigate, and order multi-page documents. Since the early days, thumbnails have evolved from low-res icons to miniature versions of the layouts themselves. That's what you're seeing on the screen. It looks like, I've, oh, you're not. Then yeah, we're actually just seeing black, unfortunately, right now. Let's uh, let's uh, let's keep trying this then. Hold on, because certainly my narration's not going to be enough to entertain you for anything there. Yeah, that's great. We're seeing a uh, thumbnails on the right, half and half print on the left. Yep. yep. So as I was saying, kind of on the left, you're seeing kind of early version of uh, Aldous PageMaker. The, um, the, the thumbnails uh, are, the, uh, are the kind of navigation thing there. And on the right-hand side, you're just seeing thumbnails as viewed in PDF. This is a huge radical shift from the late 1980s version of what thumbnails were and kind of how we think of them today. So um, just like Architects shift between different representational devices like planned elevation uh, section and detail. Publication designers shift between different tools to access the scalar and contextual ways of seeing they provide. Thumbnails are a tool for seeing the whole book at once, usually, and something you never experience in a physical book. They're also a kind of tool for manipulating the book at its largest scale. Okay. So what I thought I was gonna do was uh, give you a kind of backstory, like a technological backstory on thumbnails, then talk about uh, how they get used and then give examples, but it's too much. So we're just gonna, 
So that first part was, was the backstory. We're gonna jump to chapter three now, which is kind of examples. Um, and so I put together examples of three different, um, three different books that I've done lately. Um, and I'm gonna talk about those books and I'm gonna kind of use thumbnails to talk about them and hopefully make some of the points. So, uh, so the first one is, is this book called Modeling History. I, I have to explain a little bit about the, the book and James, hopefully you'll uh, correct me if I'm completely off. So, uh, so Columbia uh, GSAP over, over a long period of time accumulated the, the student models from a, a course that Kenneth Frampton was teaching. I think it was called, uh, you know, it was, a, it was about kind of structures of, of building. And so they were kind of student models where they figure out how to kind of build things. And over a period of time, they had tons of these models that had to go away. But in some ways, they needed to kind of make something to commemorate them. Uh, and so a, a plan was, was hatched to, uh, to create a photographic project with James Ewing to kind of photograph the, the models, but to do it in a, in a smart way where the, the photos of the tectonic models were sort of about the language of photographing architectural models that were appropriate to the different projects that the models were of. So it was like a core building that was photographed in a particular way. James kind of went back and kind of um, rethought how that would happen and created new versions of these, of these tectonic models in, in the kind of those language were kind of similar, similar um, languages. And then the models and that were kind of put together into kind of exhibition, the, the models and this. Okay, and then there's a third part of the project, which is this book. Um, and that's the kind of the thing you need to know. So uh, this was kind of created as, as part of that project, was partially a development project, um, partially a celebratory uh, project as a way of, um, of kind of creating dialogue around those objects. And um, yeah, I would just leave it at that. So this was actually produced in a very small edition, but it's a very strange um, particular book. Okay, so immediately you can see that it has a, some structural quality. There's a, a soft outside, and then there's a kind of black stripe in the middle with two uh, white parts on the edge. So it's a sandwich. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the process started by looking at sizes of books. So it kind of brought to a meeting all these different books as examples. And, um, and again, James, sorry to reference you so much in this first segment, but I believe it was James that picked up this book that, that actually wasn't there for the reason that he picked it up. It was a, a book by the designer Carl Martins, and it features um, these signatures that are folded but not cut. And, and, uh, and James says, this is fantastic. If we turn it upside down, it could be like a, uh, a folder that we could do photographic prints and put them in there. So literally creating some sort of a book that is an archive, almost like a, a physical archive for these, for these photographic prints. Okay, that's the kind of starting point. So then I have to back up a little bit and say, okay, what does that actually mean? Because maybe you guys deal with books or maybe you kind of don't. So the thing on the bottom is a, a flat sheet. When you print something, it goes through the printing press as, a, as what's called a signature. So you have eight pages on each side, most often, sometimes 12, something else. And it gets printed on both sides and then it gets kind of folded up. It gets folded up and then it gets bound. And in the end, the parts that are kind of still physically there get trimmed off. And uh, besides from the spine, that's what makes a, a kind of book. So the idea here was to use these signatures that were uh, folded up, but not cut on the bottom side so they could act as folders. And you would kind of, you create a bunch of those and you would create a, a cover structure that they would go into. Um, so this is the kind of diagram for both of those things for a signature and for using the same size sheet, but folded slightly differently to make a cover structure. 
Because the thing with covers is if your cover has loose pages on the top, it, it, when you touch it and it goes on the bookshelf, it gets shredded almost immediately. So you want to have some kind of uh, structure on the top there. And then the idea was so these kind of photos would go into this, uh, a portion of the book uh, that acted like a folder. Okay, so at that point, we're kind of, I'm gonna jump further along in the process to where there's uh, some idea of what these photos were. There's a kind of a little bit of a study of what the proportion of those uh, images are. And then a look that if we kind of considered these different size books, the different size and proportions of the book would enable a different range of, of photographic sizes. So in other words, the tall one could be much taller in relationship to the square one if the book was kind of rather narrow and, and vice versa. I'm gonna kind of use this matrix to try and figure out the optimal size for the book. Okay, and then I'm kind of, I'm jumping ahead. All of a sudden the book's made and, uh, and we're kind of seeing how the, how the photo goes inside. So the kind of idea was uh, in this section that I'll talk more about later, there are kind of photos of the process of making the photos. And then the actual photos are kind of tucked into the sleeves. So it's sort of like process, the book shows process, and then the actual objects are inside. And some of those um, photographic prints are uh, black and white, some are color, uh, some are horizontal, some are vertical. Okay, now we're at the uh, thumbnail section. So, so a lot of this book was developed by looking at thumbnails. And I realized everybody sees thumbnails, but uh, most people don't probably think in thumbnails. So, so I thought it would be interesting to just step through what's actually here. This is the full book, uh, including the cover. Uh, so it, it's relatively few pages. This is the structure that comprises the color, the cover in thumbnails. Uh, so a front cover, a kind of inside flap, a back flap, a back cover. Just zooming in the front cover, uh, because this doesn't have to appeal to anybody other than um, a very specific audience. The, the front cover just acts as a table of contents of the textual, uh, primarily the textual parts. The back cover acts as an index uh, in black and white of the of the photograph, photographic prints that are inserted. So one thing to note, I'll say it here, but then it applies throughout the book. If you've ever printed in black and white, you know that if you're gonna get full tones in a black and white image, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna sacrifice some of the tonal range. So in this book, what we're doing is we're printing in two hits of black on the cover one hit of black is kind of establishing the photos and getting their tonality right. And then the second hit is making the outlines around the photos and the overall thing kind of much darker. So, so that the black, blackest black of the photo is, is black or it's 90% black, but then the black of the background is much darker. And the only way to accomplish that is through multiple hits. It's a, sort of the way duotone works, but um, applied in a blocking type way. Okay, then this is the book without the cover structure. Um, what I'm showing there with the numbers 1, 17, 33, 49, seems a little mysterious to most people. They're increments of 16, which just shows you the first page of the signature that we talked about later, So, uh, or we talked about before. So what you can notice is that on page 17, which is the beginning of that uh, black background section, that begins on a new uh, structural signature and it ends on a structural signature. So you have one signature in the front, two signatures of, of this other thing, and then one signature in the back. Okay, and we're, kinda, we're just gonna take out the, um, the black section for a middle, for a minute there, so we can see what the textual sections are. There's, um, there's sort of three textual parts and then some front matter, which is just a title and some back matter, which is 
the, bi the bios of Kenneth Frampton and James Ewing, and then some credits in the back. So if you kind of stack these guys uh, to the left, and you might say, why aren't they all the way to the left? That's because some of them are starting on a right-hand page, some starting on a left-hand page. Um, you can see kind of uh, their similarities and differences. And we kind of just zoom in on a much closer view to kind of take a look at what the pages are like. So they're on the same grid, but each uh, section actually has different linguistic devices that it has to uh, accommodate. In other words, uh, one has kind of quotes in it. Another, another one, uh, didactic reality is a, is a conversation back and forth. Uh, and it also has uh, images uh, that kind of are linear. The case for the tectonic actually has images, but they're, but they're not specifically linear in the same way. So they sit in the margin. So this gives you the range of, uh, of page types there. Then we'll kind of jump to the middle section and how that kind of works. So, okay, I kind of buy that. That's a bunch of uh, pictures and folders, but how it, how it more or less works is there's an intro page that, that introduces the section because this uh, is basically the photographic project. So there's one page and then they're kind of divided by the, uh, the model themselves. So there's a Foster model, a Riedfeld model, a Utsin model, a Wright model, so and so. Then those pages more or less work like this. They're, they're photographs of the, um, of, the, uh, of the process of taking photographs. Sometimes there's uh, photographs of the original photography of the model uh, from back in the day. And then there are quotes about the process from both Kenneth and also James interspersed. And then that kind of more or less looks like this. Then here's the kind of unusual part. So used to, if you work with books, looking at these things as spreads, but you're not used to looking at pockets because books don't have pockets ever really. Um, so, so to sh shift the way you kind of think in thumbnail mode to pockets, this is these little um, upside down carrots are where the pockets appear. It's hard to remember the process exactly, but we must have all been incredibly brilliant because there were 16 uh, photos that, that go into uh, 16 pockets. And so this is kind of how they align. There are two uh, Norman Foster photos, three Rietfeld ones, make sure you can see the one that's sort of in the gutter because the funny thing about thumbnails is that they run almost like text, right? Like they're, they're linear left to right, but then they come back to the beginning. So you also have pockets in, in, in there and that's how those, those guys align. So but the point here is a lot of this book was kind of done in always referring back to thumbnail mode but when you look at a page of thumbnails, most people say, oh yeah, I work in PDF, like I, I see that for what it is. But a lot of the times we, we don't necessarily, there's not been a lot of discourse around it. So you can recognize that language. Then I just end this section with um, going back to the photo of the book. The thing I find really charming at this point, and excuse me for being charmed by something I kind of worked on, is, is the way it's like, a it's like a sandwich that you got too much, you got enthusiastic and put some extra cold cuts in or something. It has this kind of bulge in the middle where the, where the, where the photography uh, sits inside the folders, which, which I actually like a lot. Oh, and uh, we, we didn't, we didn't um, work on this, but these are just kind of photos so you can understand what the other uh, event was. This is the, exhibition component of the project, which is showing the kind of models and the photographs of the models. Okay, that's the first one. Here's the second one, which is a very different project. Uh, we did a book together with uh, Low Tech uh, called Objects and Operations. Uh, kind of looks like this. And to tell this story, we, uh, we, we had, um, gotten to know the, the low tech people from, 
from various interactions and were fans of their work. Uh, if you don't know their work, they kind of they tend to work with re uh, upcycling kind of materials. Most most commonly, the thing you've seen most is their work with uh, shipping containers, M multiple shipping containers stacked, cut, kind of uh, reconfigured in these different ways. So they, they approached us, they already had a publisher in Monticelli and they already had an idea for a book. I guess uh, Ada, I think, but maybe both of them had been taking these photos of stuff in the street, stacked industrial items, kind of systems of things that they, that they thought were um, super beautiful. And they saw in the photographs the exact thing that they were trying to do in their, in their built work. So they wanted to make a book that, that basically had right-hand images of, of what they were calling their urban scan. That was their language for these photographs. And on the left-hand side, they wanted to have square images of uh, their built projects. And they kind of, they wanted to organize them in color order. So that was our starting point. And they had produced three monographs of their work before um, that, that were kind of like, uh, I guess, very successful for them. Uh, but the thing that we were interested in as a precedent was these, these books that they had produced in art context, like for art galleries or art shows when they, when they moved into that sphere. And this was a, a, like a thousand page book they had made called Urban Scan, where they were just more brutal about um, collecting things, ordering them and, and, and presenting them. And we thought th this is a lot more like what you what your interests are in your work and also your interests in the content that you're gonna be presenting in the book. So, so we started with the, um, with the taking very seriously the notion of this square. It's, it's squares, you know, everybody loves squares, but, uh, but they're kind of hard to deal with. So, so, so here you just see the, the original, the first grid thing you'll notice is that we're trying to figure out a system for using square images that take up two thirds of the book, but stay in the same grid structure as everything else. So the margins are increments of the, of the typographic grid, the images, everything uh, shares the same increment. And what that gives you is kind of a, a caption typography that happens on the back. So the same caption language can caption their projects or caption their urban scan images. And on the same baseline grid, you have this larger uh, moment that can be used for uh, the beginning of chapters. Okay, so then here's the prop. Here's one of the million problems. Um, the top one is sort of the thing that I was showing you. It has a inside gutter that's meant to accommodate uh, you know kind of a spine that doesn't open all the way but it's but it's not very like it's not very rigorous right so the bottom one is what we kind of dream about like something that's super standardized where all the measurements are kind of reduced but it means we have to have a kind of an, a lay flat spine on the thing so if we're going to take it to an extreme it has to um, has to work that way. So I'm gonna show you a couple of spreads from the book. The first thing you'll notice, look at that inside spine. You're gonna notice it's, inc it's inconsistent because uh, whenever you get a, a tight uh, margin, you're gonna notice inconsistency more. But this gives you a sense of how the, the sections work and how the color distribution work. Black and white on the right-hand side, um, their projects organized by color on the left. Uh, left, the typography is the color. Right, the typography is black and white. So then we spent a lot of time trying to kind of design at the largest scale this kind of book object that would also use an approach to materials that was in conversation with their work. So stuff that was about uh, processes that were laid bare. Like if you cut something, you should just kind of be put in the machine and just cut um, and things like that. Um, and one of the things we were also trying to avoid was books 
because of the way the inner book block is joined to the um, to the binding case, a lot of times you get this uh, depression or a line that happens where the book page opens when you open the cover, and and we want and the problem with that was the that our design was all about these squares that would go all the way through the volume, like, and if you put a line there, it basically destroyed the kind of illusion of the, of the square. So an, another problem was, uh, and sorry, this is like the, the copy of the book that's been like out on my balcony in the rain and uh, all, all different things like that. There's the kind of way that the, the last signature joins to the inside end papers, that's also particularly problematic. So we were able to configure that in a way where we could kind of keep the um, design conceits and the squares and the margin, but it was, it was quite a wrestling match. So this is what the front and the back matter looked, looked like. Uh, the table of contents is in there on the second page, believe it or not, it looks like everything else. So the point was sort of to flatten it brutalize it in some ways, make it all the same so that you could kind of see the, the strangeness of the pairings and you could kind of read a book, left page, left page, left page, left page, uh, right page, right page, right page, right page, uh, in some ways. Okay, so, so this isn't the actual book. This is just a set of spreads that makes it easy to understand the intention. So if you see the first row, see it's kind of yellow, or the second row, it's yellow. The next one, it's orange. The third one goes from orange to red. That's kind of how the how the book works. Repeating images on the right, project images on the left. And now I'm going to kind of just flip through the actual book uh, to get a sense of of how it's kind of playing out. So first thing, notice these are the moments where the color changes. Okay, so we go from yellow cover, we stay in a yellow section, then we move to an orange section, and then it continues, it loops back around to yellow. Then the other thing I'm gonna to wanna to point out is these are the project pages that are on the left. So it's kind of weird to see how do the weird thing. That's the whole thing. Those are the project pages on the left. These are the photographic black and white photographic pages on the on the right. Okay, is anybody seeing some stuff that's not black and white photographic pages? Yes, I am. Okay, so as you know, systems are made to be both followed and broken. So, so there are moments through the book where, where uh, the, the low tech team felt like, well, I would just have to show uh, this kind of two of this kind of project image, or we have to show two of this image of uh, shipping trucks or whatever next to each other. So they're still using the square thing, but they're showing a more of a panoramic image uh, using the two squares. Okay, that was explanatory. Now I'm just going to step through the book. Okay, that was pretty fast. Here's the um, Here's the whole book. Uh, so in some ways, there, there's a lot to talk about uh, within this book that, that's not necessarily in the scope of this talk. Some of the things are the various inventions of color languages that the, that the low tech team invented to try and kind of take projects that were, um, were were um, within the, like, let's say the red project zone, but necessarily weren't red themselves to kind of exist within these color moments um, and, and where they kind of stay in the system and where they kind of move. And it's a, another conversation too, to talk about how the language kind of works throughout the book. Okay. That's the end result. And then I'm going to talk about a third project. How am I doing on time over here? You're okay, Glenn. Okay, okay I'll go fast on it. Um, so another project uh, that we did together with James. Um, 
again, I have to give you a little bit of back framing so you can kind of uh, you can kind of get why the decisions were made. So I believe, if my memory's halfway decent, that this was the first uh, book of a photographer, primarily of a photographer's work that uh, Columbia Books on Architecture in the City was publishing. So there was a, uh, of course, it was not the first book with photographs, right? But it was the first book where a photographer and their project was the primary, was the, was the focus. And the photographer's name, not the editor or not the organizer would go on the cover. So, so again, we kind of started with these uh, discussions about scale and what, what sort of book it should be. Um, this is a concept image, which uh, it just tries to take us back to a discussion that books always go through, which is, is this a picture book with text or is it a textbook with kind of pictures? Because they each um, sort of require, they each necessitate possibly different things. Printing photographs, there's, there's usually a desire to print on coated paper. That means wood pulp lined with clay. You know, it's like it's most of the things on your bookshelf are a good portion of them are that. Or uncoated paper, which is much nicer to touch. It's much easier on the eyes, things like that. So uh, the kind of concept that came out, and I'm not so clear where it even came from, was that maybe we could kind of Maybe we could kind of print on a print the print on a paper that had photos on a glossy side and the text on the on the on the on an uncoated side, and then you could kind of be comfortable reading the text, and you could have really luxurious, vivid photographs that the photographer would like. Just to give you a sense of the content, uh, there's sort of a, a political history essay, there's, um, there's a kind of two pieces by the photographer, and then there's an archive of Niemeyer's, um, photographs of Niemeyer's blueprints of the kind of projects that needed to be included. Okay, now, boom, thumbnail mode. So this is the book as its entirety. So when we, when we saw the first book, The Modeling Architecture, but I showed it to my wife and, um, and she said, oh yeah, that looks good. It's like a sandwich, you know? It's like, it's like I could see that it was like bilaterally symmetrical or whatever, the organizational principle was easy. When I showed her this one, um, she was like, I don't know, it looks all scrambled up. So I think that's that's always a good prompt for me to try and kind of explain what the logic is here because it reveals itself in a different way than the, than the sandwich uh, motif kind of does. So the first thing you'll see is that there's a bottom section that's tinted green. That's the kind of archival images, but but maybe let's start at kind of different point. The the first piece is the cover structure. Again, remember the cover is a different structure than the inside of the book in the world and it plays a different role. So we take that away and, um, and then we've still got something pretty complex. We take away the, uh, the kind of archival section and then I'm gonna do something that hopefully explains the book. Um, so these are the coded pages, right? So the coded pages, the coded side of the paper has all the photographs and then the uncoded part of the page or the uncoded spreads have kind of all the text. So then let's kind of, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so you kind of get a little bit more of a sense of how that works. Also a inherent quality of um, thumbnails, right? So again, textual part, then zooming into the textual part, the thing you kind of probably notice is that it's um, it's sort of reduced. What's happening is um, the, it's one column of text on the left, on the left side, uh, when there's images, they run in line in that column. The, the headers are kind of more or less in that column. 
And on the left side, uh, sorry, on the right side of the right page is the caption for the photographic image that's going to follow. So we managed to contain all the textual material. Then you flip, uh, you flip and you have more of a, a pure experience. But this is probably not a good representation of what you'd experience. It's something more like this because the experience is a lot more like spaces and alternating between uh, typography and image and then moments where you're flipping past open spreads uh, interspersed with photographs. Okay, then this is our what our kind of our photographic section looks like uh, zoomed in a bit. And those images tend to vary. Uh, some of them sit, they almost all sit asymmetrically to avoid whatever it was the photographer was putting in the center of the photo, but they vary in the, in the arrangement and ordering was in collaboration with the photographer. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of what these things are in relationship to each other in time, I'm just kind of flipping through. This is not the correct order. It's just, um, it's maybe also a conversation about book photography that if I was gonna show this, I would need a whole bunch of pages that were photographs of blank uh, pages. And I think our photographer we commissioned to do this uh, would have a, a coronary. We say, I won't do it, I'm wasting your money. Um, so then let's take a look, brief look at the archival section. Again, these are where the, um, the archival section isn't one thing. It's a, it's a kind of series of um, different archives of different building projects. So the black lines that are here are kind of dividing the one, two, three, four, four projects. And then there's a bit of back matter uh, at the end there. And that basically looks like this. We, we thought it was kind of, um, the sign new signature begins on the left. So we thought it was kind of nice to um, transition from no color into a, 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 a block of archival stuff where the, where the background color began. And then they kind of more or less look like this. And some, um, what you're seeing here, if you read across, uh, three rows across are three different um, portions of the archive. Notice some of them have, uh, so be below the, the archival images are translation, are, um, Translations, I believe, or if not translations, uh, I'd have to zoom in. I think they're translations of the text on the on the photographs on the on the on the drawings. Okay, and then there's just one last point, and I'm kind of done here, which is talking about the cover. So it's because we use two sided uh, paper for the inside to kind of address this issue of reading versus looking, we we used um, we used book cloth, but the wrong way, inside out, for the uh, for the cover to kind of call attention to the two sidedness of it. Plus, we also thought that the book cloth itself was really the back of it was really beautiful material, which had to be silk screened. And how it works is um, this first image is a, is a is a one color screen print of the very first image in the book, which of course is four color offset on glossy paper. There's another conversation to be had. It's not the place for it, which is about trying to photograph things that are glossy. Uh, one of the pet peeves of most book photographers is trying to create impossible conditions where things aren't um, shining or reflecting. So the idea of, um, of creating uh, reflections on things uh, perhaps belongs a little more to the world of advertising than than uh, artistic book photography. So yeah, that's uh, that's me. Thank you. Great, thank you, Glenn. Um, so it's it's interesting to you know, have you two paired together, um, and I start to think about this idea of of process and. James brought us through process in terms of how uh, changing processes shaped content. And I 
then coming into the modeling history book that you explained, Glenn, uh, which was interesting for, for me to see. Of course, I've seen the, the, the book, but the, that course, Studies in Tectonic Culture, was something that I um, TA'd for for many years, I think about three years at Brampton. And, and those uh, models um, I'm familiar with uh, from in, in much less complete looking states. Uh, but I guess the point I, what, what I want to bring into, uh, or I want to bring the two of you into dialogue in um, thinking about this idea of you know, how processes shape content, um, and then in particular in modeling history, how you allow the process to become the content. Um, and I wonder if you might share a little bit of your experiences together you know, as you sorted out uh, the idea to exhibit the process in that particular book. And as an aside, I'm curious, I, I think I recall that the images are and it are uncoded in um, modeling history, but then the there are inserts. Um, I think you mentioned, Glenn, that are the photographs on coded paper. So you show them in both in both ways. Maybe I can say something specific and then bounce it over to James. Um, there's a funny anecdote about about um, working with the printer on the book, which is, um, you know, we had this idea that that the the book paper and structure should kind of be soft because it was going to be combined with these glossy prints, and so uh, a lot of the time you're looking at the same you're looking at a photograph of the photograph being made, and then you're going to see the photo that photograph. So we wanted there to be some distance, both um, like uh, in the uh, materiality and surface condition of those things, so that you know they're they're pretty close. You know they're kind of close, and if you're not if you had a couple of glasses of wine, you may not even notice that they're kind of different different things. So we were working with the printer, and the, the printer came back I think twice and said, "No, no, it's not possible. Like these images are soft. They're all soft." I said, yeah, well, the idea is that they're going to want them to be soft because then you're going to see a super sharp version of it. And they say, okay, we'll take a look at it. And then they go back and they say, we've sent you, you know, we've sent you proofs and it's soft. <laughs> you'll, never, you'll never pay our bill in the end because <laughs> photography is soft. <laughs> it's like, no, but that's the point, you know. Um, so there's always a little bit of ne negotiation there. Maybe I can throw it back to James for the for the for the larger. Um, quick. Yeah, I mean, I think well for me actually, you know, one thing I had meant to say at the beginning of my talk, it's it's in my notes, but I just plowed right through it. Is that if I have any thoughts about the materialities of discourse, it's because I've been learning from graphic designers. I mean, I think that seeing your talk, Glenn, it's such a reminder of. Um, you know, to return to like Ashley's invocation of the shop drawing, like, you know, these are such sort of finely tuned details. And the fact that uh, designers like Glenn are so able to sort of bring them to the surface and make them uh, questions instead of things that are just sort of natural, I, I think is part of what for me is really invigorating about working on projects like this. And I think that, you know, it's it's perfectly possible to do like, really fantastic books in the sort of the, the kind of normative mode, whether it's of, of printing, binding. And, and, you know, many times we do that. I think many times it's the appropriate thing for a project. But one of the things that is a treat about many of these uh, particular projects is that they invite you to sort of make a process uh, and, and make the process uh, define like what the thing's actually going to be. And I feel like the way we've usually done that is by deciding like, what is it about making a book that we're going to radicalize in this particular book? Like we're gonna find something and we're gonna tune it up so high that the printer is gonna ask us <laughs> whether we're doing it right. You know? And, and it, it, it's usually something different within different projects, something that speaks to uh, the material. And then that's one of the, the really fun parts of these collaborations. I had to add one other materiality story to the modeling history book, which is that, it, that so the inserts are, were actually printed by a photo printer because we were sort of picturing it kind of like the 19th century sort of 
the paste in or the tip in that like the, the these like art images would be produced in a totally different register from the book. And I think it was Glenn who cursed us with the idea of uh, stamping the back of the image. And we were doing this on a budget. So we did this all in the office and it took that paper forever to dry that stupid stamp. And so we had these like hundreds of photographs like arrayed, like we actually like did it overnight so we could clear out one of the studios. We're like stamping all of these things and stuffing them. It was, uh, so I also have an extreme affection for the sort of charms of that book because I remember it as a moment where the sort of consciousness of like the labor of making a book uh, came into the office instead of something that was happening like over there at the press, uh, which was a really meaningful thing for me too. I like the idea of thinking about a, a, a topography of process. It sounds like that's what was going on there. Uh, so we have a question in the chat from, from Seth Thompson. He says, uh, James, and Glenn, James and Glenn, you've both mentioned the role of technology in the printing process in, the online, in online publication. What is your perspective on the role of technology in, dig, in digital tools for designing books? Glenn's thumbnails hint at a systematic modular, modularized approach to layout. Would that approach translate to automated scripts or algorithmic layout methods? I think you guys can pull up the, um, the Q and A if you need to read that one. It's um, a hefty question. I mean, it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a broad question. And, um... And yeah, I mean, people have been doing algorithmic uh, scripts for for um, document descriptions since the since the seventies or eighties. You know, as soon as as soon as um, scripting became a component, as soon as things became digitized, people were kind of figuring out. I, I think David Reinford did some kind of uh, some interesting work in that kind of world. Maybe even for the Buell Center. Um, early 2000s on some of their books that were using this uh, 19, early 1980s or late 70s scripting uh, language, which is what, um, you know, the, the internet's kind of uh, based on like, a, you know, kind of markup. It's basically a markup language. It just kind of functions a bit differently. And of course, now everything's kind of, it tends to be based off the same um, mother, mother scripts, but at the beginning they weren't necessarily. I'll say one thing and then try not to hog the mic, which is, I, I, it's been a discussion since there's been, you know, like, it's always a discussion. How does the process, how do processes um, shape what, what, do you, what do you do? Or even like, they have invisible, there's like invisible forces within uh, or implications within the tools we use that kind of move you in certain ways, the same way economics kind of do. Um, the, the, to to pass the re, least re, least resistance, and you could say that about almost you could um, itemize the various things that um, in in different software programs and and talk about what they literally make you want to do. Like thumbnails line up um, line up uh, book pages in a row like text or like uh, storyboards for a film. But that's not how you experience kind of uh, book pages ever. So when you line up book pages like a, in a line and let them see you, let, it, let you see them all together, what, what is it, what are you, you know, like what's your knee jerk reaction? Like what should happen? Uh, well, then they should make a story or they should have a kind of progression like a musical progressions, A, B, A, or they should be serial and repeating. Like there's a, a, a fairly finite number of, uh, reference points that if you don't dig into it too, too deeply, it suggests, it already suggests what you should do um, in the way, in the way, you know, it's like, what would you like to do with this? <laughs> like, it already has some prefab answers in there. And so sometimes we kind of try and, you know, figure out how to, how to just do the good version of that. And sometimes try and figure out how to go a different, you know, like see that those signals and try and go somewhere else just to kind of open things up. But James, I, I love to, uh, I know James from collaborating on projects, but I, but I know James's work much less, uh, the academic work you've been doing. So that was a, a 
huge treat for me. It's like a, exactly many of the things I'm super interested in. Yeah, and you know, it, it, if I could actually just say something quickly to that question also, um, I think one of the things that's interesting for me is that if print demands certain forms of organization, maybe the digital demands others. And I think for me and some of the digital publication work that we've been doing, uh, print is sort of necessarily relational because there's binding, right? Like unless you do a project without binding, which have happened, then you know, maybe we've even attempted that before. Uh, but with the digital, you have uh, like whatever your object is, whether it's an essay, a chapter, an image, these things become more sort of uh, individual and can have their own sort of vectors uh, outward. And so I think that for me is one of the, the ways that the sort of organization uh, of, of thinking about publication between print and digital sort of works. Like how do these, what are the vectors through which these things relate to each other? And what are the vectors that, that sort of get them out into the world? That's a very abstract answer, sorry. Well, I, you know, I appreciate um, thinking or zooming, zooming out. You, you both had us zooming out and zooming in, right? In terms of, it, it's clear that you're, you both focus on a certain amount of details and thinking about these frictions between technology and production. Um, I think there's something to be said for uh, the current, short attention span, which came up in another question in the chat um, that has been exacerbated by the internet. And I think that in a way, the, the media that's produced and placed there needs to respond to that. And books actually you know, allow a moment to, to step back and, and, and slow down and, uh, and deliver content in a, in a more considered way, which came up before and I think that the idea of pulling out toward in looking at the um, the thumbnail version of entire books gets back to something that came up in the first session with Diana and Rado um, about not having the expectation that someone is going to read from start to finish uh, and embedding different methods um, to to guide uh, to guide readers and allowing them different resolutions at which uh, to engage with content. So thank you both very much, Glenn and James. Um, I think we can move on to our last session, which Adam will introduce. Excuse me, let me unmute myself. Um, uh, thank you, Glenn and James. And um, let me introduce um, uh, the first speaker of our final session, um, Jesus Fasala, who's a Spanish architect and writer um, I'm really, really happy that uh, he has um, come to participate in the symposium today. Uh, he's currently an associate professor at Rice University. His work focuses on the problem of realism and architecture uh, through the production of design and scholarship. Um, uh, his, he's the author of Seamless Digital, Co Seamless Digital Collage and Dirty Realism in Contemporary Ar Architecture by Park Books in 2016, and Epics in the Everyday, Photography, Architecture, and the Problem of Realism, uh, Park Books 2019. Um, he's published articles internationally um, in magazines such as El Croquis, AA Files, 2G, Log, Harvard Design Magazine, Domus, and Architectura Viva. Um, uh, Jesus has studied architecture at Harvard University uh, Graduate School of Architecture, the Escuela Tecnica de Superior de Arquitectura in Madrid. Um, he's a licensed architect in Spain, where he's worked in the office of Mancia, I pardon my Spanish, which is non existent, and Tunión Arquitectos from 2006 to 2012. Um, recently, he opened his own practice in Houston, uh, where he has been uh, focusing on producing a series of projects that study the relationship between architectural form and urban space by focusing on housing. Um, at Rice, he directs the Affordable Housing Laboratory, a unit providing research and development for community development corporations and other nonprofits in the affordable housing sector. Um, I've personally been extremely inspired by um, Jesus's writing, uh, specifically on architecture and photography. Um, and I'm very excited to pass the stage to him right now. Thank you so much, Adam, for the for the warm welcome and for the and for the invitation to speak both to you and Ashley. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about basically my writing on on photography and architecture, and more more specifically, uh, my last my, my latest book, Epics in the Everyday: Photography, Architecture, and the Problem of Realism. 
And, and so in, in this book, I, uh, on the one hand, I, I try to, to cover what I, what I, or I try to describe what I think would be a, basically a, um, a way to rewrite the, the idea of uh, realism in, in architecture, which is in my mind sort of under, under, understudied. But it's also a book about the relationship between, between photography and architecture. And more, more specifically, uh, it's not a book about photographs of famous buildings or how famous architects get their, their work photographed and disseminated, but rather about how the, um, I would say the consumption of documentary photography is an ongoing influence in the, in, in the history of modern architecture. So before before I start and, and, and after seeing the, the wonderful uh, intervention so far, and I, I feel like I need to say that this book, like all of the books that I or most of the works, uh, most of the books that I've uh, produced, is done in collaboration with my brother Luis Basalo, who is a Madrid-based graphic designer uh, and and artist, and and maybe it would have been actually more fitting to have him come with me today and just talk, talk about the process of making this book and. That, but maybe maybe it would have been more similar to the other to the other presentations today. So anyway, I'll talk more about the sort of scholarly uh, content, but I, I wanted to at least give a nod to Luis because it's such a pleasure, and for me, I could not imagine any other way of making books that wouldn't uh, include this very very active uh, sort of collaboration in shaping uh, the object as much as the content. So. Um, like I said, one of the things that I that I try to do in the book is to to somehow uh, give my two cents on on this idea of realism and, and within or between those two disciplines of so photography and architecture, being two disciplines that are partially utilitarian, right, as opposed to other forms of of uh, and other visual arts, they were all they are always suspect of being ingrained in the in the utilitarian, and so they share like a common thing, which is that they have a problematic relationship with, uh, with realism. And I mean, in, in the end, there's like a more general way that I talk about this problem, which is uh, that I see like through the decades, a, a competition between the influence of notions of realism that come from the social sciences and notion of realism that, come, that are more disciplinary in, internal to each of either architecture or, or photography, but, but the competition is very real in both. And it's very interesting also to see basically how these conversations jump between, between disciplines and how similar concepts come to mean different things as well. And that's a more general uh, sort of a line of thought that is then also illustrated by a series of case studies where I more specifically talk about uh, specific moments in history in which architects have been influenced by artists who use photography to approach the, the built environment. So basically how images of the uh, anonymous built environment produced by, by, uh, by what I understand to be a lineage of, of people working in the fine arts come to be a prevailing influence on a series of architects uh, through, through the decades. Um, so the first, uh, and to give you an example, the first uh, case I study in the book is uh, about the photography of Nigel Henderson in post-war London and how it became one of the primary influences for the architects, uh, uh, Alison and Peter Smithson. Basically, and uh, uh, and how what what I understand uh, is as a sort of ongoing pulsion among early modern architects or or, or post-war modern architects, which is that they use the documentary photography of the the fabric of the city uh, as a way to try and somehow retain a, an umbilical connection to to the reality of everyday life. But if, if we think of how modernism becomes increasingly ex exclusive after after the war in general and the discourse of modern art and modern architecture becomes more and more abstract, I think documentary photography becomes this necessary sort of link to the, to the reality of the city, to the reality of people's life. And, but it's very much a process of cultural consumption, right? Architects become fascinated, fixated, or obsessed with the work of these artists. And somehow through uh, consuming their work, there's a contamination that happens. Something very similar happens uh, then in the second case study where I write about the work of Ed Rocher uh, and, and, and his influence on subsequently Denis Scott Brown and, and, and Robert Venturi. And I really appreciate that this was also one of the milestones in James' uh, talk today because I do think it was a, a very important uh, 
moment, but it's, it's also similar in a way that uh, he identifies a, a phenomena in the built environment that hasn't been explained, that has emerged somehow regardless of current cultural discourse or, or, or the activities of architectural academia, and, and he brings it front and center through, through his photographic practice and develops a whole language and a whole way to, to treat it that then the architects feel like they actually need to appropriate. So when Ben Gurion Scott Brown decides, uh, when actually when Denise Scott Brown decides that she wants to study Las Vegas, she somehow knows intuitively that she has to appropriate the visual language of the Truche uh, as one of the primary tools to do so. So again, this idea of a process of cultural consumption uh, where the architects are looking at documentary photography but then by the time we get to this point in the 60s, the architects already sort of appropriating some of the techniques of, of the artists as well. So let's keep forward a few generations and, and in the 80s and 90s, uh, I write about the relationship between architects uh, Herzog and Meron and the photographer Thomas Truth, who, and here we can see in the, in, in the screen an image of the, their main collaboration, which is the building for the, uh, Library for the Technical University in Eberswalde in Eastern Germany, which is a project that they did together, but then also became the, the subject of a, a famous work by Thomas Truth, where he overlaid an image of the building with, with, uh, with this sort of a ghost, ghostly image of a couple driving by in a, in a scooter. And where I think what we can see, and in a way it's, it's similar. I mean, the, the, the architects look at, at images that Truth is producing of the anonymous uh, urban fabric around Düsseldorf, etc., became fascinated with his, with his vision of, of reality and commissioned him to, to start photographing their own work. But, but very quickly, the collaboration becomes much more involved. Right? And actually, in this project is pretty hard to, 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 to assign roles, like who is the architect here, who is the artist, like it's very, very pretty much a sort of very involved and horizontal collaboration. Then that, that becomes even more acute I would say in the, in the last case study that I deal with in the book, which is the collaboration between German artist Thomas Demand and the uh, UK office of Adam Caruso and Peter St. John, where in this case, it's even harder actually to, uh, it's even harder to, to distinguish the roles between the photographer and, or the artist and the architects because they both work in a very similar medium that involves the making of physical models and photographing of physical models, et cetera. So, by the time to get to this point, it's not only that the, the, between the late uh, or between the 1940s and the 2000s, it's not only that the collaborations between artists and architects around this idea of the anonymous built environment have become much more sophisticated and much more ingrained and much more horizontal. It's also that as they become more elaborate, as the collaborations themselves become more elaborate, uh, the somehow like this initial uh, drive towards realism is somehow perhaps not diminished, but damped by the many layers of representation, by the sophistication of, of the discourse that is built around these layers of sophistication. It's hard here, by the time we get to this, uh, to this point in history, to recognize that almost ethical or political drive of the Smithsons wanting to look at the working class neighborhoods through the photography of, of, uh, of Nigel Henderson as a way to make their, their architectural project more politically committed and more relevant. And so, I just interrupt you because there's a funny echo happening. Um, I, I don't know if there's something you can do about that. I uh, I'm not doing anything different than I usually do. I may try it. Uh, maybe not using my headset. Just want to be sure that everyone is also muted uh, in case there's somebody who's accidentally unmuted. Is this is this better, perhaps, or worse? Nobody, everyone's muted. Um, I, I apologize, but I don't know. I don't know that anything's wrong on my end, to be okay. honest. Look, it's soft, so I think we can keep going. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I was, uh, I think, saying, uh, trying to explain how the, this, the nature of, of the methodology uh, of these collaborations changes very radically. And, and then in, in making and working with the content of this book, one of the main questions for me was, okay, what happens in this historical art that changes this relationship between photography and architecture and, 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 and their collaborations, right? 
and I, and, and I came to identify a very specific moment in the around the mid 60s, which occupies the center uh, of the book, literally as an object, and which I thought was very appropriate for me to talk about today because it's very much about the impact uh, of architecture in print and how the act of putting architecture in print has these uh, reverberates and then sort of changes in my mind, changes both photography and architecture uh, after that. So um, I'm sure this being an event hosted by the Pratt Institute, many of you know this, these images already. These are photographs taken by artist Tessel Lewitt to illustrate his 1966 uh, article titled Cigarettes, which appeared in Art, in Art Forum, where he basically, it's like, a, in my mind, like a preamble to his famous paragraphs on conceptual art, where he talks about how the, the buildings that were built in Midtown following the, uh, the, the former uh, uh, city code, the former ordinance, were um, had basically were precluded, or, or the architects working with this code were precluded from having to think about the shape of the buildings because the shape of the buildings came from basically the uh, the way that the formal code uh, somehow dictated the massing. And this is a moment in time where the new the, the ordinance is void, and we are starting to see in Midtown Manhattan the new glass towers of the insurance companies and the banks, basically the new uh, pure glass and steel prints uh, being, being built. And he makes an argument that it's actually a good thing that the architects were not able to, to somehow, that were relieved from the burden of figuring out the shape of the buildings. Uh, and that, that, that somehow he identifies in, in this idea of the almost anonymous, uh, the architect or the anonymous builder, this idea that there are things that are um, perhaps uh, uh, there's a series of positivistic factors that may or may not be arbitrary, but that they have this function of relieving uh, the, the artist or, or, in this case, the architect from making sub subjective choices. And, and very quickly, we can see how that becomes basically uh, how it's, that's just an illustration of his argument for conceptual art. Basically, how the idea of being a driver for a conceptual artist is a relief from the artist having to express themselves in a subjective, in a subjective way. And, but it's very important that the, that the original argument for the, uh, is, is supported by these examples from, uh, uh, I would say, semi-anonymous architecture. And this is, again, 1966. In the same year, we see uh, pretty, pretty impressive coincidence around these same topics. So again, 1966, uh, Dan Graham publishes Home for America, also in the, uh, in, in the Art Forum magazine, although this is not the original uh, layout. This is a fake layout that he produced afterward because he did not like the actual layout. But it's basically another uh, uh, another moment where an artist identifies. In this case, he's writing about the uh, spec housing that happens uh, between between New York and New Jersey and how the the logic of real estate development, the very abstract and sort of very schematic logic, I would say, of uh, uh, of real estate development. Is, is almost like an engine for the production of these things that is uh, uh, comparable to, to how conceptual and abstract and conceptual artists are thinking about the production of their own life. So it, it does two things. I think it establishes a referential attitude for the conceptual and, uh, and, and, and um, an abstract generation, but it also somehow basically establishes this idea of uh, anonymous construction being generated by parameters outside of the control of, of the artist as a, as a modus operandi. And uh, very few months later, these are more images from, from Graham's uh, layout. And then a few months later, uh, Robert Smithson with his monuments of Passe, where, which in this case is not so much about the new developments, the new housing developments or industrial parks, but actually about what happens in between them and how this new, this new uh, Sort of approach to land land use and uh, these new processes of urbanization are are changing the landscape of the region, and again doing something very similar to Graham, where he's finding uh, works of art in a way, like he's identifying these anonymous uh, uh, objects and, and and somehow declaring them works of art through uh, through basically his photography and his writing and his publication of this uh, of this piece. And um, of course, Ed Boucher, who we had already noted, started doing his uh, publication, photography and publication projects in the very early 60s, but then joins and influenced this generation in New York 
in a very strong way. And then there is in 1966, with his, uh, with his every building on the Sunset Street that, that we've already talked about today. So, um, I mean, so maybe, I mean, they, they all somehow coincide in this moment in a way that is pretty impressive for a generation to really coalesce around both uh, uh, the topic of uh, anonymous construction or urbanization, the, the uh, vehicle of photography, and then the medium of the publication. Uh, it, it's really, I think, quite quite unique to see all of them coalesce in that. Uh, so what then what happens later is somehow they each go their own way. So for instance, Graham actually uh, embraces the, the materiality of corporate architecture and, and, and sort of late modernism. Uh, uh, while perhaps Robert Smithson, you know, takes on a much more cryptic and a much more critical approach, but but in a way it doesn't it doesn't matter so much because what we what is important to understand is that both their coalescence in when they do these publications uh, around these topics and these formats, uh, but also their practices are set in direct opposition to the generation of uh, uh, of abstract expressionism. So. Uh, if in abstract expressionism, the, the, the paradigm of the artist was is sort of uh, somehow uh, it, it was somehow the, the accumulation of authenticity in the in the person of the artist that got translated to to a unique object through this very gestural and physical uh, 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 means, and 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 this is what they're trying to combat basically when when someone like Etouffé decides to do something like this right? yeah, that they, somehow. And that's the way that art historians have traditionally uh, written about this moment, where basically the choice of uh, utilitarian architecture, uh, low, low, uh, low scale documentary photography, and cheap publications, either through magazines or through, or through, or through booklets, are a trifecta of weapons to attack the authenticity or, or the singularity of the work of art. Of uh, that, that, that was the paradigm at that point with abstract expressionism. I, however, argue in the book that it's impossible to conceive that all of these people would focus with, with, uh, with such intensity in, in, in a topic like that without actually uh, taking it seriously, seriously in and of itself. And I think in that sense, it's interesting to also in that generation listen to what uh, Tony Smith uh, uh, said repeatedly, the way that he, that he talked about this change in the, in the built environment around them, where he uh, famously wrote about his experience driving in the uh, New Jersey Turnpike before it was finished with some students and how he was completely out of words to describe what he was seeing. And he actually, in the end, he ended up uh, describing it as an artificial uh, landscape without cultural presence were his words. And so, again, uh, in, in a way, the classical reading of this moment in art, in art history is that what all these artists say, Smith included, was that because, because they were lacking words or they were lacking formats to deal with this reality that what they were calling what for a reform of the formats and the means of art. But I think it's pretty clear also that they were uh, somehow uh, really concerned, in, in actuality concerned with this transformation of, of the built environment. They were in equal, in equal measure fascinated by and terrified by this uh, sort of uh, the degree and, and, and speed of transformation of, of the built environment. And, and urbanization, and they were somehow putting this topic front and center uh, and tried to bring it to, to, to a larger cultural conversation. So in the case of, of the generation of the abstract and conceptual artists, there is always this uh, irony and this distance uh, where it's, it's really hard uh, to, to really understand what the relationship is to the subject matter, you know, whether, it's, whether it's ironic, whether, it, uh, whether it's critical, whether it's uh, um, Really, really, how much the, these these works and these publications are about the world itself and about problems or events in the world itself, versus to what extent are they inwardly uh, directed to, to producing a shift in the in the art scene or in the in, in art history? And and some some of that question in my mind is answered then when the when the next generation of artists uh, takes over, uh, and now we are looking at a photograph by Robert Adams from 1975. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the generation of the new topographics who, who basically, they are not, uh, as opposed to the conception and, and abstract artists, they are not artists who happen to use photography for a purpose, 
and they are actually fine art photographers fully whose project is fully uh, uh, devoted to a traditional uh, or, or, or a full uh, engagement of photography, but who happen to inherit both uh, the topic and, and a lot of the discourse from, from the abstract and conceptual generation. So in the case uh, uh, were collected uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an exhibition in 1974 in the, in, in the George Eastman House, the, the Kodak Museum, uh, which, which is what keeps them the name. So, you know, the, the topographics is, is used more, more broadly, but it's the name of, of, a, of an exhibition as well. So I'm just going to talk about uh, four of these uh, photographers very briefly, and their different degrees to which they were uh, influenced by, by this episode of the mid-60s. So in the case of, of Robert Adams, basically, he's a very classic photographer. He's inheriting the, the American tradition of landscape photography from Ansel Adams, and, and basically, what he's doing is shifting the attention from the natural parks and other, and other topics to the suburbs of, of cities. So he's almost as if by changing natural parks uh, from, or as if changing from natural parks to, to trailer parks, actually is all that needs to happen. Uh, but somehow the, the photographic apparatus can, can remain the same. Uh, then in the case of Joe Deal, also from, from that generation, it's a little bit different. I think the photographic approach is is, uh, uh, is, is somehow classic to some extent, but what he does is that he writes his uh, protocols for himself for the production of his different series that are very similar to the way that, that conceptual artists you know, write scripts for themselves, but then they execute or somebody else executes. And so what he did uh, in this series is he, he established that he would only, that he would walk up to the highest point in, in, and he was exploring the outskirts of Albuquerque uh, and he would he would just look for elevated vantage points, and then without changing the the, uh, the sort of uh, the lens, he just look down until the horizon disappeared from the frame, and then just take as many photographs as were available to him, uh, uh, following that, that protocol. Right? And so what so what starts to happen is that you get these very um, and again basically these compositions that seem in between intentional and unintentional because. He's trying to limit his own subjectivity in the same way that that Solowit was arguing for the reduction of subjectivity through the introduction of scripts or somehow uh, arbitrary constraints or, or positivistic constraints. And then perhaps most uh, uh, most contaminated uh, 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 of, of all in this generation is the work of Louis Bart, who I think was uh, was an art student who whose practice was was always photographic. Uh, but I think by the time he was in art school, the influence of the, of the abstract and conceptual art generation was so so strong that somehow his photographic production is a response to, to their own two-dimensional production. So uh, I mean, I've only talked today about the the, the works of uh, the Witt and Graham and, and Smith only in print, but we all know that main production is three-dimensional, and and so in a way, with the generation of the of the abstract and conceptual artists. There is this work that is done with photography and publication that is almost uh, like a way to attune themselves to the reality of the world at that point in time that then influences the, the output at, uh, in, the, in terms of the dimensional work or sculpture. And by, by the time we get to someone like Louis Pauls, he somehow realizes that if you are good enough and intentional enough with photography, you can bypass the, the production of uh, three dimensional work. Right? That the, instead of being inspired or influenced by, 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 by some of the involuntary compositions of uh, the, the built environment and then produce your own work based on that, which is what Solid would, would, would do, that you can actually find the works in, in the, in the uh, anonymous built environment. And so when we look at, when we look at, at especially the early photography of Louis Valls, we, we run into a lot of these moments where basically what he's doing is he's taking this uh, these uh, new forms of, of urbanism and architecture that are emerging due to sort of late capitalism and the service economy in the US in, in, in the 60s and 70s. And he's somehow uh, basically ele elevating these, uh, these involuntary compositions to the, to the, uh, to the realm of, of works of art through his, uh, through his photography, in what, uh, in what he describes as a process of making sense of this new reality. He says, but maybe as an artist, I can only make sense of these things, of these things and these new 
uh, uh, processes aesthetically, but at least I can do that. Okay, so maybe last, uh, uh, so fourth and last in this new topographic uh, iteration, I'd like to talk about uh, Bernd and Hila Becher, who, who in a very similar way, uh, basically build a career out of the very strict and rigorous documentation of uh, of uh, anonymous architectures in their case that they describe as industrial structures. So what's what's interesting and different about uh, the Becher is that they they develop in parallel uh, to to the abstract and conceptual and the new topographic generations, uh, but in isolation. They they start their project in the late fifties in Germany, and they only become internationally known and they only visit the the, the U.S. in the early seventies. So. It's somehow, uh, if you follow their, their career, they, they follow a very similar process by which they start with a certain unease or a certain almost nostalgic drive to, to preserve the built environment that is, that is changing. So I think maybe that's a very important distinction that when we, uh, when we look at the photography by Louis Boltz, this is the new architecture that is erasing the uh, former realities and imposing itself on the world versus in the case of Bernd and Hila Becher, what they photograph is the old architecture that is being uh, ab abandoned and, and sort of uh, demolished and, and, and vanishing. But, but, in, but in many ways, the, the process is similar. So it, it starts with this sort of concern and, uh, about uh, the changing built environment. In their case, the first series is actually about the very, uh, the very uh, beginning of industry in Germany with the minor villages of the, in the 18th century. Then eventually, as their photographic language of documentation becomes more and more uh, defined and, and structured and rigorous, they, they start to basically, it starts to take on a more morphological approach or, or there's a formal component that starts. starts to gain a lot of strength and then the of uh, people like uh, Dan Graham and, and Carl Andre. And it's important, I think, that it was perhaps in, in forcing themselves to produce this catalog that they, is, that they started to think a little bit more intentionally about how to, uh, how to display the work and how to uh, show their images. And so it was, it was in, in forcing themselves to work with the spreads of the book that these comparisons became more explicit in their work where it was no longer about the documentation of, of different types of industrial buildings, but it became, it became much more about how, how they're formally interesting and similar, but different. And that's how they arrive at this uh, uh, way of exhibiting the work, which if you've been to a museum and seen photographs by Bernard Hila Becher, this is probably the way that you, that you've accessed them to what they called uh, typologies in, in a very loose borrowing from architectural terminology. So by the time they get to this way of understanding their own work and showing their own work, this is no longer an archaeological uh, archaeological project. Uh, these these uh, uh, buildings are not uh, grouped together here because they are built with the same materials or because they are from the same time period or because they are from the same geographical region. They, they are still the same type of industrial uh, uh, structure, but they are just put together because of the way that, uh, that we can infer these morphological relationships between them. Uh, which again is, is very similar in, in the way that uh, you think of the arc of development of someone like Son Luis, he starts looking at his cigarettes uh, and, and in a way like it's a reflection about the way that things are in the world and the way that, that, that forms are produced anonymously in the world. And then, and then through his own deployment of the series, eventually the series becomes this tool for the display of morphological variation and the creation of new forms. And, and actually, uh, uh, for the betters, that becomes the primary way that their, that their work is understood and disseminated. And so when they uh, when they achieve stardom in the late 80s and, and early 90s, that's the way that their work is understood primarily or almost as a sculpture. They actually received the Golden Lion for a sculpture in the 1990 uh, in Venice Biennale. So, uh, but, but perhaps I think what, what that art describes is also a process of emancipation by which uh, I think what's, what's perhaps most important to note is that 
well, okay, what is what is the what is the action and what is the reaction? And and so what we see at the beginning of the talk is how uh, abstract and conceptual artists borrow uh, utilitarian photography or, or sort of documentary photography and um, and anonymous architectures because they are tainted disciplines because they are semi-utilitarian and, and and they and they use those those qualities as well as they use uh, print as a medium to make to make a certain to make a certain point. But in that process, they, they, so what they do is they basically inhabit the skin of the documentarian, they inhabit the, the, the skin of the anonymous builder to create their work. And that fundamentally changes the social contract for both photographers and architects. And I think what's, uh, for me, the most interesting is how basically they, they, they in turn open up this, this new field for the next generation, who in the 1970s can basically embrace again photography with the full, with its full capacity and its full range of skills and techniques, but uh, but with a discourse that is that is very different. Right? And the same happens for for architecture. So in a way, what I'm trying to say is that such things as conceptual architecture, conceptual art. Or conceptual photography are not possible without the episode of conceptual art. And I'm showing here an image by Aldo Rossi, and I will finish here. Uh, there are many parallels between between what I've just described in the field of, of art and photography and what happens with the with the coetaneous generation of architects. And I think Aldo Rossi and, and also Matthias Umbers perhaps are the best examples of people who start again with a very rigorous documentation of what is happening in the fabric of the cities and trying to make sense of it in a systematic, rigorous way. So both prompted by a certain unease by the changing uh, cities, but also with a very rigorous approach to how, how to make sense of these processes. And then eventually as the work evolves, this, this rigor of analysis becomes more and more you know, sort of uh, mobilized or, or actionable as, as a way uh, uh, as a way to use the series as a tool for the production of, of architecture. But, but more than that, I think more than, more than what it does to architecture formally, what it also does is that it changes the way that these architects talk about their work. Right? The way once, once, the, once, all of, once the relative positions of photography, architecture are changed within the constellation of the arts, then they basically, their social contract of both architects and photographers is changed as well. And I think I will, I will leave it at that. I hope it doesn't too much. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to introduce our, our last speaker, Mustafa Faruqi. Mustafa is an educator and founder of the Lab Lab for Architecture a purveyor of unbuilt work, unpublished volumes, and unsolicited pleasures that are instigated by clients such as humor, desire, memory, irony, alienation, vulgarity, and loss. Projects by the Lab Lab have received support from the New York State Council on the Arts, the Drawing Center, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, and the Norwegian Ministry of Culture. In 2017, the Lab Lab was awarded the prestigious League Prize for Young Architects and Designers by the Architectural League of New York. And in 2020, the firm's work was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art, where it is currently on view in the exhibition Broken Nature. Mustafa has worked for and alongside a number of New York City design firms and institutions, including Marvel Architects, Supermass Studio, and the Brooklyn Museum. In 2018, Mustafa was the Rainer Bannum Fellow at the University of Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning, where he recently returned to teach in the school's graduate program. Mustafa? Okay. Let's see here what happens. I'm going to share the screen. We're going to go to presenting view. We're going to move this over here. sure what's happening here just bear with me a second uh just bear with me one second here i'm going to just try and change this okay okay um oh shit all righty hold 
on here. I don't know. Cancel. It was showing before, Mr. Yeah. Okay. So this is working. Does that? Can you see the? Can you see it? Um. Not now. I okay. So hold on. I think I shared the wrong screen. Hold on here. I'm sorry about that. So drawing. How's that? There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm just gonna start. Thank you so much. Um, and if there are any problems with this with the audio or with the visual, please either Adam or Ashley let me know. So I know that I'm not just talking into the air. But um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, like everyone else, thank you for um, uh, arranging or hosting this great meeting. Thanks to School of Architecture at Pratt and obviously to Ashley and Adam for curating this really great uh, event on a topic that's so important to me and my work. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, I'm excerpting this from a larger project, though probably not as adequately as Jesus managed to do with uh, Epics in the Everyday. So forgive me if I read to you for a bit, but I'm gonna tr try to be uh, as engaging as possible. So here goes. Uh, in one of my more exotic misadventures as an undergraduate at Columbia, I enrolled in a summer Spanish course for beginners across town at Hunter College. Every afternoon for six weeks, I boarded the M66 Crosstown bus, ice latte in one hand, gently used copy of Hablamos Español in the other, brimming with that unique brand of brazen self-indulgence that's normally accepted as, useful, as youthful optimism and naivete. Um, ultimately, my polyglot fantasies ended in failure, mainly thanks to a series of late arrivals, all the fault of Crosstown traffic, I can assure you. The summer cascaded into a jumble of tardiness, class disruptions, disapproving looks, failed exams, and other small embarrassments that I continue to associate with that summer specifically and the Spanish language in general. And I'm sorry, Jesus, about that. Um, but one thing that I want to bring up uh, is uh, I did manage to retain a few more positive nuggets of the experience, albeit in varying states of dormancy. One of these is my introduction to esperar, a Spanish verb that spans, precariously in my mind, the distance between its English equivalents of to wait, that is to remain stationary in expectation, and to hope, to desire with expectation. Esperar was roused in my mind years later while reading Johann Peter Hebel, Walter Benjamin's commentary on the 19th century German language author's body of work, which includes short stories, tales, and poems. In describing Hebel's powers of storytelling, Benjamin offers a distinction that is critical to his understanding of the true teller of tales, that between the historian and the chronicler. For Benjamin, the historian is fixated on world events as they happen at precise points on the spectrum of time, somewhere in between past and present. Um, the chronicler, on the other hand, emphasizes minor events in a telling meant to convey a truth about the world at large. As such, the chronicler performs a kind of allegory that is far reaching, one whose picture plane might cut at the neighboring village, a far off continent, or even the planets, moons, and comets of the universe. This expansive scope of the chronicle is, according to Benjamin, what lends the chronicler a capricious and unpredictable connection to the entire breadth of reality. And I just wanna draw a line under this notion of reality in an expanded sense, because it's this challenging of the stability of reality, or at least the stability of the image of reality, that is central, not just to Benjamin's sense of storytelling, but I think also relates to Jesus's really compelling conclusions about these contested notions of the real that we just heard. So after reading Johann Peter Hebel, it made me wonder, might the two edges of esperar, waiting and hoping, find their counterparts personified in the characters of Benjamin's dichotomy, the historian and the chronicler? After all, the historian's position is necessarily fixed inside an ocean of cause and effect. The chronicler, instead, stands outside of this ocean, on its shore, observing it as a kind of palimpsest, always imagining how disparate patches of water, waves, shells, and foam, close and distant, might somehow be kindred. Um, and I should say here that uh, I'm stealing right now. The ocean metaphor is Benjamin's, not mine. It's something he introduces when discussing the crisis of the novel. This is Berlin Alexanderplatz, uh, experimental novel from 1929, Weimar Republic uh, by Alfred Dublin. And in his review, Benjamin identifies the storyteller as the watcher on the shore, someone who lies on the beach, listens to the surf, and collects shells washed up by, by the waves. 
So while the historian waits on the sea of world events for history to be revealed, the storyteller's chronicle embarks on an act of hope. It ignores the tides ebb and flow, instead engaging with any current factor fantasy to tell a wider, more meaningful tale. This departure is a flight of magic curation, one rendering the chronicler's story a hybrid reality that somehow manages to recount the ways of the world. So I'm starting my talk today with this synopsis of the hoping chronicler as a means of opening up Walter Benjamin's greater understanding of storytelling and its demise. For Benjamin, the chronicler actually functions as a device, one of many, which he uses to explain not just the unique position of traditional oral storytelling, but also to let, lament the demise of this, his most beloved narrative form, at the hands of mechanical outputs, such as the novel, natural, and pulp fiction, et cetera. So what I want to try and suggest to you in the next 15 minutes, I hope, if I can, is that while storytelling may have been the unexpected collateral damage, the roadkill associated with the bloodthirsty book of Victor Hugo fame, Benjamin's epic story actually lives on, buried but still alive, in between the lines of architectural drawing. That is to say, the touchstones of storytelling, as evinced in Benjamin's praise, appear in methods of architectural drawing and some quite common to the medium, and we'll take a look at some of those in a minute. As such, while the printing press may have instigated storytelling's decline, this machine's invention of the architect and this new figure's promulgation of architectural drawing in print may actually have saved the storyteller's voice from extinction. Okay, so put a different way, and my sincere apologies to James Graham, this is a horrendous corruption of your narrative, which begins with Vitruvius and De Architectura. While video may have indeed killed the, the radio star, the lyrics, the beats, the rhymes live on on MTV, YouTube, and otherwise. So needless to say, this argument would naturally have a number of implications for architects, our way of working, etc. I just like to set up this proposition, then I'd like to introduce the question of representation while thinking in parallel about magic realism, sp specific kind of, of printed fiction, uh, and that could be a kind of testing ground for Benjamin's anti-mechanical vision of storytelling. So, one. Uh, just as some background, Benjamin's understanding of storytelling is going to be rooted in a larger critique of industrial capitalism. Again, James sort of touched on a lot of these things. There's a reliance on technology, mechanization, and so this disembodies human labor by severing its ties to the worker. This has been discussed. This really comes through in Benjamin's unique outline of storytelling, though, as a craft, something engaged with at length in this, uh, this 2019 collection of his essays. So here we learn that for Benjamin, storytelling represents a kind of handicraft, a way of working in which the material is human life. As such, the storyteller's role is definitively analog and consists of reworking the raw material of experience in a solid, useful, and unique way. The hopeful story-collecting chronicler then becomes a plausible device for Benjamin in as much as this character's trade in ephemeral fragments, ideation, and performative gesture uh, he uses these to construct a narrative that stands in opposition to a more formalized choreographed work of the historian. Um, another uh, sort of dichotomy that illustrates Benjamin's forceful defense of storytelling against the onslaught of print and its related productions is his comparison of storytelling to the novel. Uh, and what's also worth noting here is Benjamin's assertion that the separation of story from the body implies a second disjunction between the author and reality. Um, and I'm just going to quote Benjamin directly here. He says, the birthplace of the novel is the individual in his solitude who is no longer able, oh sorry, who is no longer able to speak about his most important concerns in an exemplary way, who has no one to counsel him and who has no counsel to offer. Nothing contributes more to the silencing of the inner self. Nothing kills the spirit of storytelling as thoroughly as the outrageous proportion the reading of novels has attained in all of our lives. So you love it when Walter Benjamin gets angry, right? It's always really, really, it's going to be good, right? And I don't know if you showed this this time, uh, but I, I, uh, uh, Jesus, but I wanted to mention this image that you showed previously in a different, maybe at a different time, but I wanted to draw a line in the direction of your research, Jesus, especially as it relates to an interest, uh, this new interest by artists of the anonymous fabric of the city or sort of a vernacular of the city. And you point to this by sort of looking at sort of this work of art versus the anonymous fabric in the background. 
And so, Jesus, you talked about this, the desire to capture or represent this everyday world through photography. I just want to simply suggest that these practitioners that you mentioned were working along the lines of Walter Benjamin's critique of the novel and its detachment from what he calls the realness, however wretched, of the everyday. Um, so going on to two. Uh, so very soon after my encounter with Walter Benjamin's persistent defense of the storyteller and his caution over storytelling's decline, I was visited in my Brooklyn studio by an agent of the United States Department of Decelestialization regarding the design for an intake facility. The proposed facility was to be sited on Governor's Island in the lower New York Harbor. It would receive and serve as a holding area for a substantial number of anonymous clients in transit between heaven and earth. The client's journey was not instigated by one particular event. Instead, I was told they were reacting to a series of degradations, humiliations, and restrictions resulting from a servitude to God that was both eternal and uncompensated. To make matters worth, worse, the client's obligations to God included an eternal life devoid completely of sexual desire or desire of any kind for that matter. And as unending celibacy was not enough to make me recoil in horror, the agent added that her clients had no sexual organs to speak of, thus precluding even the possibility of masturbation entirely. Normally, this would be the type of project I would dodge with outright vigor. After all, it's well known that public agency work is often less than lucrative and even more often winds up in litigation and net loss. However, my arm was twisted by my visitor's particular turn of phrase to describe the condition of her anonymous clients. She explained that they were caught up in an unfortunate and frustrating trap where an outcome was initially anticipated, but then dismissed as soon as its impossibility as an object of desire was made apparent. And so they waited in place for the desire that might offer them hope. It's too bad, she concluded, they're stranded somewhere between hoping and waiting. On hearing the melancholy predicament of the client expressed in this way, I was reminded yet again of Esperar Benjamin and the watching chronicling storyteller, magically and whimsically assembling multiple disparate currents culled from the ocean of existence, the result a tapestry based on hunches. I became entranced by the notion of the architect as magician, building this story between wait and hope, where a once stranded expectation steps foot into the dominion of hope-filled desire. Three, like magicians, architects trade in the supernatural inasmuch as our work can overcome several forces of nature often at once, sunlight, gravity, water. But a more inc incisive account of the connection between architecture and magic can be found in drawing, the primary and fundamental act of architectural practice. Drawing is, after all, a sleight of hand that allows us to produce an illusion, an other world that purposefully misrepresents reality because it has no basis in it. Through the vehicle of drawing, we're able to recreate the magical adventure of the storyteller's chronicle, departing from the dogma of accuracy and arriving at a result that, however absurd, embodies a wish that tells us our own truth. Our alchemical drawing mutates passive waiting for inspiration into the cherished anticipation of hope. And this magical behavior of the drawing as it makes speculations on and propositions for some other reality is best captured by uh, Sir Peter Cook, everyone's favorite Archigram member potentially. And he says architectural drawings are easily able to transcend any reference to reality. Yet, um, this is not some abstract or nihilistic proposition, more an ambition born of the belief that architecture has much left to discover and that the architect can make drawings that transform him into a form of seance. And he continues, a state that, that's a seance is a state that's necessary if we are not to constantly project bits and pieces of ideas that are constantly referred back and implicitly held back by an implicit puritanism of the ordinary or the necessity to always quote from the realizable. So the relevant point here being that new realities might only be possible if drawings purposely misrepresent or challenge what reality is. That's to say the work of speculation might very well necessitate a misrepresentation of the real. Um, this challenging of one stable reality in favor of multiple perspectives of the real, uh, uh, perspectives that are dynamic and debatable, immediately calls to mind the, the multi-view drawings that 
are and have been intuitive to architects for centuries. Uh, and so these are some multi-view drawings of the armories at Florence by Michelangelo in the middle of the 14th century. And then these drawings by young Sir John Sohn on his grand tour of the continent uh, made after the advent of printing. And it's interesting how these narrate or perform the story of the wooden bridges of Switzerland in which the wooden board construction, the sawtooth construction plays such a, a leading role. These images speak to the mixing of competing visions as a kind of second nature for the sketching architect on his travels. Uh, just hold on a second. This is an image of this now destroyed bridge that was destroyed in the Franco-Prussian Wars. All of these wooden bridges were destroyed. And so the, it's an interesting thing, right? Uh, Sohn goes as a student, draws all of these, but their reality actually lives on in the work of his students. Um, the bridges no longer exist. So his students' visions of Sohn's own projections. Okay, four. Uh, so you may at this point think my emphasis on multi-view projections, sharing space on a page seems a bit forced or even far-fetched given our dis discussion around architecture, print, and a challenging of the real. But I would here suggest that these drawings get to the heart of Walter Benjamin's mashup of storytelling and montage. For Benjamin, montage as a literary device represents the absolute power of the authentic. He says, the montage explodes the novel structurally as well as stylistically and opens up new epic possibilities, especially formal ones. He goes on, the material of the montage is far from arbitrary. True montage is based on the documents. Here for the first time, it has been placed at the service of epic literature. Uh, let's see. So this connection between writing and its deployment of competing imagery brought forward by the montage resonates quite clearly with some works of contemporary fiction. Uh, Olga Tokarczuk's Flights is one such example, the book, and I don't think you can call this a novel, resists being pinned down to any one location or format. Uh, this, way of this way of narration allows Tokarczuk to embody the storyteller's montage in Benjamin's terms. The book integrates fragments such as maps, brief observations, as well as longer tales. And those tales are themselves interrupted, so you're not sure if you're actually being referenced to a previous portion of the book or actually starting something new. What's particularly interesting about Tokarczyk's piece in relation to this presentation is the storyteller's grafting of the mode of narration, the composite sketches of montage, onto her actual characters. So there's this one fragment Tokarczyk outlines, or in one fragment, excuse me, Tokarczyk outlines a slightly unsettling picture of a character, Eric, the ferry captain, who is in fact a constellation of attitudes and demeanors, all competing for a role in the telling of Eric's story. And I'm just going to uh, read a little bit uh, from this uh, sort of synopsis of Eric, the ferry boat captain. It was a question of states of mind. Each day, he could choose between two. One was sensitive, quick to take offense. He would be sure he wasn't as good as anybody, that he was lacking what everyone else had, that he was a deviant of some sort who didn't even know, for God's sake, what was wrong with him. The other state of mind strengthened his conviction that actually he was better, unique, exceptional, that he was the only one who understood the truth and that he was capable of being exceptional. And he somehow managed to spend a number of hours in this elevated self-esteem and even days when he felt, let's say, somehow happy. But then it faded like intoxication. And by way of hangover, there appeared the terrifying thought that in order to seem like a person worthy of respect, he had to continually fake it in these two ways. And that worst of all, someday the truth would come out. It would be revealed that he was nobody. Tokarczyk's written image of Eric, sketched in between more prosaic accounts of his everyday life, captures vividly the hallmarks of Benjamin's notion of montage as a literary form that asserts absolute power of the authentic. But what I find interesting is Tokarczyk's writing of the character as an internal constellation. Uh, and that's something that, again, returns me to this issue of the hybrid or sort of cut drawing. Again, while these may seem like second nature to the practitioners in our meeting right now, the intuition to cut the perspective view is arguably quite perverse in how it's revelatory, but with complexity. The exposure of the building to the hard cut puts the audience in a position that is both augmented in terms of seeing power, but also somewhat compromised in that a kind of choice must be made with respect to where the viewer positions themselves 
in the drawing's mise-en-scene. My connection of flights to the most salient aspects of Benjamin's montage is not, the great, is not the greatest of discoveries considering the author's own association by many of her critics and readers with magic realism. Um, and this is a narrative form combining heightened language with elements of the surreal. Uh, this link makes me wonder, could this genre of narration and works by Olga Tokarczuk, Salman Rusty, and others give us some live clues about how to harness the power of Benjamin's now extinct storyteller and his montage in drawing. And just as an aside, there's multiple definitions and debates about magic realism. I'm borrowing from the definition of the Puerto Rican critic in English, uh, Angel Flores. He talks about uh, magic realism about, and also this lo fantastico in Latin American fiction. It's an act of transformation of the common and the everyday into the awesome and the unreal. So how does this transformation take place? Interestingly, we here return again to a discussion of the real, or at least how we talk about or draw out the real. Salman Rushdie's emphasis on the writer's political responsibility is particularly instructive. So uh, Rushdie says, if writers leave the business of making pictures of the world to politicians, it will be one of history's great abdications. There is a genuine need for books that draw new and better maps of reality and make new languages with which we can understand the world. Rushdie, the consummate tale teller of magic realism for over three decades, has a fuller opportunity to elaborate on storytelling in Harun and the Sea of Stories, which functions as a children's book, but also as a greater treatise on storytelling. The book tells the story of a boy, Harun, who embarks on a quest to reclaim his storytelling father's lost gift of gab. With the help of a half real, half fantastical cast of characters, Harun travels to Kahani, the mythical land of stories. Along the way, he is given an education on the necessarily multivalent nature of storytelling, including clever dictums on discerning the real. As one citizen of Kahani explains, believe in your own eyes and you'll get into a lot of trouble. Most interesting for me, and of course this is obvious to you by now, it's, it's quite relevant to Walter Benjamin's outline of the storyteller. Uh, it's Rushdie's parallel portrayal of the magical sea of stories, the source water for all tale tellers, a body that never runs dry. Aside from obliquely referencing the ocean of existence uh, that Benjamin uses to set the storyteller apart from the novel, Rushdie's sea of stories includes the key element of duration, or that is to say, uh, the elements of the story are never ending. The story never ends. In this aspect, Rushdie's treatise on magic realism's storytelling takes us back to Benjamin's image of the printing press as a kind of ultimate silencer of the sounds of the everyday. Um, and so going on to five. Needless to say, the preceding foray into the story waters of magic realism were provocative with respect to the design of the intake facility at hand. But of course, before proceeding, we needed more. So like a any good educator worth their salt, I engage some of my own students in a hypothetical exercise of healthy exploitation. Um, and so by way of a design project, I asked my students to reinvent themselves in the guise of Benjamin's chronicler to see if their collection of fragments from a year's worth of memories and observations might yield provocative designs. The results were kind of interesting. So here are three different student projects, and it'll take too long to go through all of these, but this is actually three different students chronicling the events of 2020, and they're all picking on different things from this whole ocean or morass or whatever 2020 is, right? They're picking these different things and adding them to their own stories. Um, and then those kind of lead in the sort of studio fashion to these material kind of experiments with those stories uh, and some architectural sort of spatial experiments as well. Uh, but what I found really interesting was some of these, and I, it, for time we can't go through all of them, but some of these uh, explorations were so interesting in how they materialized the calendar. So right here, what you're looking at is one student's sort of uh, kind of uh, expression of 2020 through material, and those four images all represent four weeks in the year 2020, and she was actually studying COVID cases um, at, and other sort of them are related to that. So after considering some of the student work, we began to formulate our proposal for an intake facility for our anonymous client in transit between heaven and earth. Of course, we started by taking several steps to reorient the condition of its planned dwellers from weight to hope. 
Design endeavors include a genitalia attachment assembly, as well as associated suites for sexual urge detection and testing. I'll skip this for now, but at the center of our strategy for the facility is the development of a completely new type of drawing, something necessitated by our engagement with a completely new type of desire. At the present stage, elements of the intake facility's design emerge as composite axons, as well as hybrid axon or perspective drawings. These and other representations start to chronicle the transition of the client's condition from waiting to hoping. Finally, six. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. End this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. In the final scenes of A Midsummer Night's Dream, the mischievous fairy Puck, sliding into the role of the concluding storyteller, makes amends for the collective hijinks of the preceding four acts by introducing the trope of illusion or dream. First, Puck attempts to unconfuse the crisscrossed love triangles, triangles of the play's protagonists by entrancing them with an herb that will convince them that the real events of the past evening were in fact just a dream. Shakespeare via Puck takes this trope one step further by suggesting to his audience that they too might have just witnessed a vision and as such, they need not be offended. Uh, it would be ridiculous to describe William Shakespeare as a magic realist, of course. My reason for concluding with this sketch of his play's conclusion is meant to suggest the storyteller Puck as a foil for the architect storyteller that I have set out to describe to you today. Throughout the play, Puck's mischief-making tends to emphasize a kind of confusion about or resistance to any identification of reality uh, because for Puck, an unstable, distorted scene is the most becoming uh, for human behavior uh, and, and its folly. And you all remember the famous line, oh Lord, what fools these mortals be. As such, uh, the fairy Puck's narration, particularly at the end of the play, acts as the drawn out picture of competing, sometimes illusory fragments that together formulate the rising and falling action of a Midsummer Night's Dream. So thanks to Puck, we can now return maybe finally to what got all of us started. That is Hajik's introduction to Turner's photographs of five architects. In his introduction to this collection of images, Hajik writes a relevant and compelling image of the drawing. Um, and you're all familiar with this from the prompt. The architecture, or oh, sorry, the architect can make a number of representations on a blank two-dimensional sheet of paper. All are specifically real, all are representations of a proposed coming, and all are illusions regarding space and depth. In any case, drawing on a piece of paper is an architectural reality. There's so much going on in just that one bit about illusion and reality mixing. Hajik's definition of representations on a piece of paper as a kind of container for multiple, perhaps even opposing currents, hints at the potential of these drawings to have a capacity for Benjamin's notion of storytelling, the most effective detailing of the authentic. Moreover, Hajik's insistence on the permanent split by the initial image seen inside the mind's eye of the architect, the split between viewing from a distance or close up, heightens a synergy with the multivalent storytelling chronicler whose death by printing press is so lamented by Benjamin. Hajik's assumptions about drawing also point to the continued life of the chronicler and their stories in these images, a life possibly saved by the dissemination of architecture in print. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, that was that was amazing, um, Mustafa and Jesus, and I, I appreciate being able to end with a, a nod towards the the original prompt, um, which it, the audience isn't quite um, in on that that original prompt, um, but it's uh, the, John Hadock's introduction to Judith Turner's book of photographs. It is quite powerful in, um, in my opinion, and we use it as a way to get started, where he begins to you know, not only talk about illusion, um, but uh, talk about the, uh, the spirit of space and how uh, representation can seek to capture and represent 
the spirit that we understand spatial experiences have. And I think in that regard, you know, each one of you here has brought forward um, your own way of, of capturing that spirit and, um, and helped us to untangle some mysteries about how to approach representation of space. Um, Adam, do you, uh, do you wanna start some questions off? Um, yeah, I could I could start with a question. I mean, in a way, it, it applies to both, but it's it's more of a it's a really specific question, I guess, for Jesus um, on the relationship um, in photography um, and architecture uh, between sort of I, I'd like to hear your ideas on the on the relationship between frames and framing. Actually, um, it seems that photography is kind of an inevitable engagement of the real. And yet there's also an, an inevitable kind of abstraction from the will that, that comes in this sort of the notion of, of kind of choice and isolation. You know, you see that for sure in the Beckers and even at Ruscha and everything. And so I'm, I'm just curious your own sort of, you know, how that operates perhaps in your ideas of, of, of the real. And if that, if that makes any sense to you. It makes complete sense. Thank you for the for the question. Um, I, I mean, the, it's it's also a, perhaps a, a very large large question, but maybe to answer it more along the lines of the content that, that uh, in the talk today, I would say that um, if we think of the documentary photographer as an intermediary that is uh, of, that allows the architect to access these new um, these new phenomena in, in reality. Then the act of framing is, is the key of, the, of that intermediation. Right? That somehow we are all overwhelmed in our daily life with, with the way, you know, like how reality is so measurable. Like 2020 is a good example, right? If, if, if any of us had to summarize 2020 in a paragraph, like it's been such an overwhelming year. Right? And reality is overwhelming in general. Right? So uh, I think the, when, when, when architects are facing this, uh, and more specifically in the 60s and 70s, when they're facing this increase in the pace of urbanization and how architecture is consuming sort of formerly uh, unorganized areas, etc. It's, it's really hard for them to put their finger on what's happening, partially because it's something that is not being discussed in architecture schools or anything. So when Graham, you know, takes the photograph of that specific development in New Jersey or when you know, uh, Louis Valls you know, the way that he photographs this sort of field of construction, like they're the ones who manage to put their finger on something and say, this is, this is something we need to look at. And then the way they're framing it is also telling us a little bit about how we could be looking at it. So the act of framing is, is like a, is a necessary act of selection primarily in my, in my mind, at least in the context of what I was trying to discuss today. Could be talked in, in many, many ways too. Mustafa, there, um, there, there's something that's go your your process is quite subjective, right? How you how you begin to uh, pull together uh, references from a variety of different um, media, and really are doing a, a quite broad survey of the cultural milieu, uh, and beginning in your way to frame um, the 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 objective of architecture, which we could say. The objective of architecture is to you know, acknowledge and nourish, nourish the human experience. Um, you're acknowledging the human experience in a different way using the representation of tools of architecture. And I wonder if we might you know, go back to a, um, a question that was asked at the outset to Diana and Rado uh, about your trajectory uh, in terms of your development as someone who is, is operating in architecture uh, in a very unique way. How did how did that come about? How do you think about your your work as framing your architecture and experience? Well, uh, thanks for the question, Ashley. I think that it's it's 
very much related to how you started the question, which is about sort of being very, very subjective. And so I think there's, you know, you can't deny that kind of subjectivity in the in the design process in anyone's trajectory. Uh, I think for me, it's just about sort of, yeah, it's where that subjectivity, like you say, finds its sources. I have though been thinking a lot now, I mean, after, you know, again, another 2020 issue, but the summer of racial reckoning and so many educators are sort of getting together in architecture schools, thinking about sort of issues of, it's become cliche, right? Diversity, inclusion, excellence, so like we're all, but like, I think this issue uh, of storytelling and sort of allowing the studio to be colored or painted by people's stories. I mean, people walk into architecture school feeling really uncomfortable, feeling like they don't belong there when their stories, like even in the studio that I kind of tried to barely, barely touched upon, uh, I think that there, there becomes a comfort. And I'm talking about the architecture, architectural element of the studio, the room. I'm thinking just in terms of like existentially being comfortable in the studio, being comfortable with design. Storytelling sort of offers, I think, that because you now have a, a kind of role in it, your voice is in it. And I think for me in this profession, I mean, it's, you know, we all know it's, it's a bit exclusive, right? I think that has been a way in for me, I mean, with, with all of these projects. So there is that sort of using different resources. Etc. But then also thinking, you know, individually about what storytelling can do for me and how it can allow me to have a position, I guess, in the field. So there's a selfish aspect of that as well. well I think, in a, in a certain way, everyone, everyone here is is a storyteller. Um, editing a book or being being an author, uh, each each one of the presentations has uh, pointed to a different methodology of storytelling. And I, I wonder if there are any of you that have questions um, across your your groups that you were paired with, or you know, Adam, if you have any more questions you want to broach with this uh, with this group, we probably should wrap up in a, I don't know about ten minutes or so, um, or a little bit over at this point. No, I think that that's a fantastic. Um, that's a fantastic thing to do right now. It's just kind of open up generally to see, you know, across across the boxes, as it were, um, uh, if there if there's any kind of kind of uh, feedback. Um, and I do think that the the kind of the interesting tension between realism and storytelling is something that's that's really been heightened for me in this last session. But I I'd, I'd love to hear that, you know, perhaps responses from from the previous um, uh, sort of speakers of, or also comments from the pre current speakers on the previous uh, speakers. So, yeah. So I, just to get it started, have a question for Jesus that's, again, sort of a selfish question. Because um, you talk about, uh, you mentioned these artists who are kind of um, turning to like the everyday and almost valorizing, fetishizing maybe, or but they're looking at it for, for a particular reason. And we have in writing, we know that uh, you know, Andre Breton did this, you know, and we know Situationists did this, getting, you know, wasted and walking around Paris and, and sort of picking from that everyday life. Do you, when you, when you're doing your research, are you, are you looking at writing and how people, because you're looking at conceptual artists and how they use the city architecture as a material. Are you looking at any writers who use the city as a material? And if yes, who are they? So I can steal them all for my own. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, and I have to confess, I usually don't. Uh, I usually don't look at, at literature as a, as a as a source. I mean, at the, I think I mean, I'm, I'm interested in how the the conversation about realism was shaped in in the realm of uh, literary criticism in the late 20s and early 30s, and and I think we're still living in the aftermath of, of that. The fact that notions of, of realism in all the other arts have been shaped by that initial uh, debate of which Benjamin, of course, was a part of, as well as uh, uh, Adorno or Brecht, etc. And uh, uh, in that sense, it, my, my sources are more nonfiction rather than, but it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, maybe it's a little bit of topic for, for our conversation today, but it's, it's interesting to see how these different people from the 30s criticize each other, criticize writing, uh, in, in terms of what they think is legitimate or not, when it comes to the political function of literature and the description of reality, right? And uh, so, 
Well, for sure. And just a quick response that I found it so interesting in doing the reading about it and then listening to the, the sort of question comes from that sort of uh, curiosity because Walter, it's weird. We as architects for visual culture, I've always associated montage with either film or some kind of graphic. Walter Benjamin only talks about montage in terms of writing. Uh, and so it's a really interesting sort of thing. Just it's an eye opening thing, really, sort of how that that form is addressed and uh, and and sort of appropriated by different people for different things. Yeah, well, Martinez Tierney's book on, on montage is actually quite good at that. I think you would enjoy it. He talks he, he talks about the relationship between montage in literature and montage in, in photography in very sharp sharp ways. And I think his his writer of choice is uh, interestingly enough uh, Ram Collas. So basically what he argues is that he's the one who manages to bring ideas about literary montage into his own writing and first and, and primarily in the architecture. And, and that's, a really, that's a really good book. I, I, I recently rewatched uh, Blow Up. You know, when, when going back to the origins of this symposium, when Adam and I were beginning to develop the ideas, you know, in addition to looking at Hayduck, um, we had been you know, talking more about photography. And you know, in the movie, I, I, I like that scene, um, Antonio, Antonio needs to blow up for, for those of you who may not know the reference, where there's a discussion over an abstract painting. And um, you know, I think within the discipline of architecture, we often you know, reference Picasso and, and how the abstract painting is about, uh, you know, constructing everything so that it can be seen from all sides. And, and I feel like there's a certain uh, reciprocity with the, the function of an editor, uh, a writer, or anyone operating in, in the manners that um, today's panelists are. And the, the comment, though, in the film by the artist who's in conversation with um, David Hemming's character is that he, he doesn't actually know what he's doing. He, um, he, he just makes shapes and then he thinks about it and uh, rationalizes it later. And, and, I, and I was struck too by the parallel to the process of, of bookmaking and thinking about uh, representation because sometimes it works that way. Um, you, you, you get a pile of stuff um, and it has to be brought together and rationalized. And I think that everyone here um, has uh, gone about doing or, or practiced different methods um, and innovative, uh, innovative techniques to, to make that happen. So I appreciate uh, your sharing all of your, your ideas with us today. And I think then we can make a call for final comments. I've, I've also brought in Seth Thompson, who, uh, as I mentioned before, he, he worked as our media designer. He, he mentioned that he might have some questions um, and wanted to say hello. Can I, um, Ashley, can I just make one also comment on blow up since we're closing out with the ideas of blow up? Another, another thing to raise from that movie. Are there? Yeah, Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, no. I mean, I think the other the other element to me that's interesting about blow up in relationship to what um, uh, Jesus was talking about, and and to a certain way, I think um, Mustafa as well, and everyone uh, is also this. You know, the famous scene uh, where David Hemming's character is searching for for truth by progressively blowing up the image. Um, you know, and as as he tries to get closer and closer to the real you know, the kind of threshold of legibility or threshold of intelligibility of the photograph, the grain itself sort of overwhelms and suddenly they're, you know, the real kind of dissolves. Um, and I, I think that's also kind of an interesting potential connection between Mustafa and Jesus. Um, the, 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 the notion of like the real is a kind of, almost a kind of an asymptotic condition that gives way, it's almost like, like, like a Lacanian real if you follow that kind of stuff. But anyway, so I just want to throw that one in there for maybe future conversation or response. And you have a comment? Yeah, can I throw in two cents? Uh, I just rewatched re Blow Up 2 and um, I, I was um, really enjoyed like the multiple ways where uh, Antonio's, Antonio is getting at the same thing. 
So I thought I could point out one uh, other example of, of the blow up, uh, the um, enlargement that then kind of um, comes into um, conflict with resolution and legibility. There's this scene where, where they go into a kind of nightclub. And so on stage is this, the rock group, the Yardbirds, which is uh, an uh, early group that at that moment has both Jimmy Page from Zeppelin and Jeff Beck, who, who goes on to be Jeff Beck, I guess. And so the scene is, you know, the, the, the moment in rock and roll is that moment where people are playing guitars through ampli you know, like they're amplifying the guitar sound so it distorts, which, it, which I read as a direct, um, analog for like taking the image and kind of enlarging it uh, until it distorts. And the scene is really funny because Jeff Beck is, you know, he's, he's ecstatic because he's playing this distorted guitar. He's very sexualized and rock and roll and stuff. But then his guitar is so amplified that his amplifier starts blowing up. And so <laughs> the distortion that's part of his charisma is put in contrast with the distortion that's technological distortion that's coming out of the amplifier. So he's going, and the amplifier is going. And so he starts to physically re wrestle with the kind of amplifier. And I thought, oh, it's so nice, like to come back and just think um, to try and connect like uh, visu visual distortion and enlargement with the sonic enlargement and kind of the. Um, both the aesthetics around those things and just the, uh, the way you just kind of Antonio's, Antonioni's weaving these different um, reassertions of the same uh, interest in techno technological scaling. Uh, plus, you know, it's just so such a weird scene. Anyway. Maybe that can uh, be a prelude to the, the talk that you told us about, but ended up going in a different direction, you, you had mentioned a, a rock poster or, or a rock album of some sort that you had designed, I think. Um, so maybe we can do this again and, and cover that topic as well. Seth, did you have a comment? Not more than just to say hello to everyone. It was a pleasure to work on the project with um, with you and Ashley and Adam. and. Um, and that uh, in choosing to post images to the social media campaign from scans of the books, uh, my, uh, my workspace right now looks a little bit like David Hemming's living room with just books scattered all over and, uh, and enlargements where I was trying to figure out what details to crop in on and, and highlight. But, um, but in any case, uh, the, the source material was, was really rich and, um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, to have hopefully you know highlighted some of these uh, these issues in the treatment of the graphics. Yeah, I think your maybe your your room looks like James's office when uh, Glenn had him stamp all those those photographs. Uh, but you, Seth, you've been incredible to work with, and um, I think everyone here uh, yeah, appreciates the the care with which you. You helped in terms of looking through the work and scanning and, and producing the um, the beautiful Instagram. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Seth, it was great to work with you. Can I quickly add to this that <clears throat> I wonder if in some way the like exploding amplifier is like the, the challenge to us here that like the the sort of by expanding the sort of scale and enlarging the way we like make discourse to the moment where it like shows its edges, where like the, the seams and the sort of like materiality of it all becomes visible. Like I, I think in some ways that's like what we've tried to do together, Glenn, and the publication projects that we do. And I, I loved the last panel because I think it really brought home one of the things that Diana brought up in the very beginning, which is that producing the thing is just the beginning and then it sort of launches into the world and the question of how media like hit us how we receive it like what they do to us instead of what we think we're doing when we produce it is such an interesting uh, kind of question so i kind of love 
the the framing of this, the 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 the, the sort of the the blow up in every sort of metaphorical sense of it, uh, is is perhaps the moment where we can like really perceive the way that media is acting on us and is producing uh, sort of how we see architecture and how we feel about it. I love that as an image. Yeah, I like that image too. And I think that maybe it connects us back to um, where Mustafa was going with the, the idea of you know, the waiting, the desire and the expectation, which as, as you were talking about that, about that I was also thinking um, in terms of how I feel when I'm working on a book, because it's an endless process of waiting and desire and expectation. Um, I think maybe where we can or where we can go from James's comment um, is that we can you know, wait and expect to see what comes next from from this particular symposium. Not only in terms of the documentation that uh, we may produce, but um, but also what the next iteration of it is um, at Pratt or elsewhere. And I guess that's, um, maybe that is where we should close unless anyone has some final comments. Um, Jesus, you're smiling. Does that mean you wanna say something? No, 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 not, not other than thank you to, to, to you and, and Adam for organizing and, and, and everyone for the interventions today. It's been so enjoyable to spend the morning here. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I think Rado um, may want to say something. Same thanks to, to you and Adam in particular for putting it all together. Um, yeah, it's been terrific. And I, I wish we, it would have been, I mean, it's, it was great, but it would have been even so much nicer to see you all in, in person. I'm sure there would be much more to talk about than what we could cover here. Sure. So thank you. I, uh, thank I you guys. can't have have dinner and a drink to celebrate, um, but perhaps, perhaps another time uh, we can we can do that. I've really enjoyed this whole process. Um, it's, uh, it's surprising how much or how many conversations it took to pull something like this together. And um, you know, my extended thanks to you know, to Adam and to Seth, as well as to Ed Spencer and each one of uh, the participants, you know, Glenn, Mustafa, Diana, Jesus, you know, and James. Um, it's been a pleasure to uh, to work with you on this. Yes, absolutely. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We will catch up in virtual space somewhere, and maybe in New York City um, yeah. eventually. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.